Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our AL amyloidosis webinar. Our previous webinars can be seen and viewed on the uh, YouTube channel for amyloidosis support groups and also on our website, amyloidosissupport.org. We do hope to resume live meetings when the hospitals uh, start to allow us to uh, attend probably late this year or early 2023, depending on how things go along. Meanwhile, for patient-to-patient -patient contact, we do urge you to join our Facebook groups. They are private and closed, and certain questions have to be answered in order for you to join. Some of our local centers have started their own private Zoom meetings for their local uh, patients and, and physicians. I know there's one going on right now in Spokane, Washington, and there's also one starting at Wild Cornell in New York City. If you're interested in attending any of these meetings, send me an email, muriel at amyloidosissupport.org or info at amyloidosissupport.org, and I'll hook you up with them. And perhaps if you're interested in starting one with your local center, send me an email about that too, and we can give the doctors a little nudge on that, okay? Um, Again, email me for any questions, muriel at amyloidosissupport.org. You won't be able to post comments in the chat, uh, and there, the Q&A won't be open today because we, you, you literally sent in hundreds of questions. We want to get to them as soon as we can. We've got a wonderful panel of doctors to help us with that. Um, the, Paula will be posting important uh, details in the chat. And so um, be sure and, and you'll see a little thing pop up saying something's in the chat and then you can click that on and see it. And speaking of Paula, um, she's in our control room today. Paula, you wanna say hi? Hi everybody, glad you could make it. Okay, and also in the control room is our special projects director, Bob Gibson. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, um, we do appreciate you emailing in your questions. Okay, speaking of uh, our esteemed panel today, we have joining us Dr. Sasha Tuckman from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They have a wonderful new multidisciplinary amyloidosis center there. And also from UNC, we have Dr. Samuel Rubenstein. And from Carmenos in Detroit, we'll be having Dr. Jeff Saunder. Um, today's cardiologist is Dr. Melissa Lyle from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, where they have a wonderful multidisciplinary center as well. And our nephrologist today is none other than Dr. Nelson Learn from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, who has one of the, they have one of the um, oldest amyloidosis centers in the United States. Joining us from the pharma world is, will be uh, a trellises, Dr. Spencer Guthrie and Prathina's Anskar Conrad, and Alexian's Julia Catini. There'll be a quick survey for you to complete when this meeting is over or when you leave the meeting. And we do ask that you complete it because it's very helpful um, in helping us develop future webinars. We'll be working off our treatment chart today. Um, and Paula will be sharing a link in the chat for you so that you can download and print it. It's very helpful um, because that way you don't have to wonder what, how, does, how do I spell the medication they're talking about or what is it? So we, and again, you can email me for that chart, muriel at amyloidosissupport.org or info at amyloidosissupport.org. And there Paula's putting the link for it in there right now, which is great. Thank you, Paula. Okay. So um, if, if we don't get to your question today, we're gonna try and get to all of them, but we're always limited for time and we always go over and you know that, right? But if we don't get to your question today, just send me an email asking it again and we'll just hit up one of our doctors and try and get it answered for you. But we're gonna try and get to as many as we can. And now we're going to hear from um, University of North Carolina, Dr. Sasha Tuckman. Dr. Tuckman? Great, thanks very much. Thanks to Muriel and to Paula and to ASG for setting this up. Um, always enjoy doing support group meetings and it's been a while, so it's good to be back. Um, and so good afternoon or good morning to the whole audience, depending on where you are. And so Muriel asked me this morning or this afternoon to spend a couple minutes talking about daratumumab. Um, obviously this is a drug that there's a lot of excitement around both in multiple myeloma as well as light chain amyloidosis. First drug that's been approved in light chain amyloidosis. And so 
very rightfully so, lots of interest and excitement around, the, around this drug. And so Muriel asked me to spend five, 10 minutes talking about this. So just a few slides to update um, the audience on the Andromeda study. And so the Andromeda study is basically the study um, that is still ongoing. It's long since closed to enrollment, but still ongoing, testing the addition of daratumumab to what's called Cyborg-D chemotherapy in newly diagnosed light chain amyloidosis. And so Cyborg-D, for those, for those in the audience who either don't have AL because you have a different subtype, or for those who are new to AL, um, Cyborg-D is one of the standard chemotherapy regimens that we use for a light chain amyloidosis. It's the abbreviation for the combination of bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone. Um, and really, I should have flipped that because the cyclophosphamide refers to the psi part, the bortezomib refers to the bor part, and the dexamethasone refers to the D part. So that's where Cyborg-D comes from. And sometimes you'll also see it referred to as VCD. They're really the same thing. Um, and so again, the Andromeda study is looking at daratumumab, um, which is uh, FDA approved for multiple myeloma, has been for many years now. And much like many other medications that we use to treat light chain amyloidosis, this is one that we've long since borrowed from multiple myeloma um, in the sense that multiple myeloma is uh, much more common than light chain amyloidosis. And so many drugs end up getting tested and eventually FDA approved for multiple myeloma. The studies don't get done to formally um, provide the data to enable um, approval in amyloidosis, and so we end up borrowing these drugs um, to treat AL amyloidosis. And so daratumumab is a CD38 unconjugated monoclonal antibody. The details don't really matter other than to say that it's a pretty simple drug that basically goes into the body and looks for this thing called CD38, which is a molecule that's on the surface of plasma cells. So we know that plasma cells are the source of light chain amyloidosis. And so CD38 basically, or the daratumumab sees that CD38 on plasma cells, sticks to it, and then can kill the cells. And so the Andromeda study was begun after there were some initial pilot studies showing that daratumumab both seemed to be tolerable and effective in treating light chain amyloidosis. And so for if there are any scientists or people in the audience who really like the science behind this, I'm not going to go into this in exhaustive detail, but this basically shows briefly and schematically how daratumumab works. So you see the daratumumab drug is that green Y-shaped molecule. You see the myeloma cell, but this is applicable to amyloidosis also. So that, that blue circle with the bigger blue dot in the middle. Um, and as you can see, the daratumumab sticks to the CD38 on the surface of those myeloma or amyloidosis cells. And after that happens, it kills the cells through a number of different mechanisms. Um, and these basically involve on the bottom of, on the bottom right, you can see that there's, con there's this concept of cross-linking. So when there's a couple daratumumab molecules stick to a plasma cell, so again, a myeloma or an AL cell, um, it basically causes those molecules to stick together. That makes the cell unhappy, causes it to die. And then, a then the, the other three um, small diagrams within this larger diagram, you can see basically other mechanisms by which daratumumab sticks to the abnormal cell and then causes basically elements of the immune system to go in and then kill the plasma cell. And that's good because killing plasma cells means that they make less of that light chain protein. We know that light chain protein is the source of light chain amyloidosis. So it makes sense that, suppress, that killing those bad cells and suppressing those, um, the, that light chain protein is beneficial. And so with that in mind, the Andromeda study, again, looks at daratumumab in combination with standard Cyborg-D chemotherapy for newly diagnosed light chain amyloidosis. Um, and the requirement of the Andromeda study was that patients have heart involvement. Um, and I'll just run through the uh, exclusion criteria really briefly, and I put sort of you know, the specific criteria as they're listed in the protocol, and then I've also put what I'd argue is probably the, these terms translated into regular English. So we get away from just the medical terminology. And so what you can see is that, again, patients were required to have cardiac involvement, but the study excluded patients with severe cardiac involvement, um, patients with severely reduced kidney function, or patients with really low levels of amyloid protein in the blood. And the reason for the last one is that one of the primary endpoints for this study was looking at how good a job daratumumab does in suppressing that bad amyloid protein in the blood. So primarily the light chain protein, but some patients had a different type of protein called an M-spike. And so you can imagine that patients that start off with really low levels of this protein to begin with, there's nothing to measure. You start them on treatment, 
you, the protein levels can't really change much because there wasn't much there to begin with that you can measure. And so you really have trouble assessing how well the drug is working. So this is something that we refer to sometimes as measurable disease that was required as part of the study. So this is how the study is structured. And so sometimes you see diagrams like this in different talks. And this one's from the, uh, si the, from the hematology conference um, fairly recently. And so what you can see is that there was a screening period. And then three, you see on the, in the gray box on the left, it says N equals 388. For the non-scientists in the audience, that means that there were 388 participants. Um, you can see that there was one-to-one -one randomization with that kind of splitting arrow. And so the one-to-one -one means that basically it's a coin flip. People enroll in the study, and then there's a coin flip to determine which arm people get assigned to. So in the bottom, the orange boxes, those are people that just got standard cyborg D chemotherapy for six months. So basically the standard of care, the best form of chemotherapy that we had before the Andromeda study was completed. So those patients got essentially the standard. And then on the top, you can see that those patients got the same cyborg D chemotherapy, but then they also got daratumumab given subcutaneously, so as a shot under the skin. And uh, the Cyborg D or the VCD was given for six months. And then for patients who got daratumumab, they got that for another year and a half. So 24 months total of therapy. And if we look at the outcomes from the study, so what the study basically showed, this is looking at some of the data. So I've kind of pulled some of the highlights. And so the primary endpoint of the study, as you can see here, is what's called hematological complete response. So in myeloma, in amyloidosis, we often talk about hematological responses, which basically just refers to how effectively whatever the treatment is suppresses the bad protein in the blood. So again, when we keep in mind that with AL, we have the plasma cells in the bone marrow, they make that light chain protein in the blood. That light chain protein is what deposits in different organs and causes damage. It makes sense that one of the primary aims of, aims of therapy is to suppress that bad protein in the blood. Less protein in the blood means that there's less protein available to beat up on the different organs. And so hematological complete response refers to essentially a level of response that indicates that the amyloid protein is so low and the bone marrow plasma cells are down to such a low level that we're really having trouble seeing them. Um, so complete response basically means that we've suppressed things so that ba things basically look normal. Um, and so when we look at the graph on the right, this shows both overall response and then it also shows the complete response. And just to kind of run through this briefly, the purple column on the left is patients that got daratumumab as well as the cyborg D chemotherapy. And on the right, that's patients who just got the cyborg D chemotherapy. And if we look at the entire bar, you can see that you see 92% over the purple and 77% over the orange. So that's looking at overall response, which is basically that the patient's M spike or light chain drop by more than 50%. That's what we call a partial response. And if you get to a partial response or better, that all figures into overall response rate. So 92% of patients who got daratumumab got into a partial response or better versus 77% of patients who got Cyborg-D. But then as far as the primary endpoint goes, so the hematological complete response, you see the red circles, where 53% of patients who got the daratumumab Cyborg-D got into a complete response versus 18% of patients who just got Cyborg-D. So a pretty marked improvement in percentage of patients who achieved over a, he a hematological complete response which means that the study met its primary endpoint of demonstrating that adding daratumumab to standard chemotherapy increases the rate of patients achieving complete response. And on the bottom, you see that the median time to best response was also better. So this just refers to basically how long it took for proteins to reach their maximally low level. And so that occurred at a median of 60 days for patients who got the daratumumab versus 90 days for Cyborg-D. So it, they, basically the proteins dropped more quickly when patients got daratumumab. And then the bottom, so subgroup analysis basically shows that the benefit to adding daratumumab um, occurred regardless of baseline variables. And so what that refers to is just a lot of times in clinical studies, we look at subgroups. So, you know, among the entire patient population, were there specific groups with unique disease characteristics who seem to benefit more or less from a specific intervention? Sometimes that occurs in this study, it did not in the sense that um, the benefit really was present for all patients across the entire study. So daratumumab deepens response rates and depth of response in newly diagnosed AL.
And so this is looking at longer term endpoints. And so you can see this one's a little bit messy, but this was an endpoint called modified PFS or mod PFS. So PFS is a term that we often use in different studies to refer to progression free survival. And so what this modified PFS referred to is basically time from initiation of therapy until either a hematological progression, end stage cardiac or renal disease, or the patient's demise. And so hematological progression, for those who don't know, just refers to basically a patient has gotten into response, amyloid protein, so light chain has gotten to a really nice low level, and then it started coming back up. And once it rises to enough of us, once it rises adequately, then we say that, that the disease has progressed and we talk about hematological progression. So this modified PFS is basically time until amyloid proteins start rising, the heart or kidneys stop working totally, or the patient um, succumbs to the disease. And so on the curve you see on the left, you can see that this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. These are very common in clinical studies. And basically, the way to interpret these curves is that as that line drops, it means bad things are happening. And so, you know, we don't have much time, so suffice it to say that the daratumumab line is much higher than that control line. And so what that tells us is that patients who got the daratumumab stayed in remission and didn't experience this modified PFS for a far longer period of time um, than patients who got the control arm of just the cyborg D chemotherapy. So basically, daratumumab kept the disease, kept the light chains down for longer, prevented development of end-stage cardiac or renal disease and help patients to live longer who are receiving it. All good, of course. Um, and then to wrap up, so just to look at organ recovery. So the big thing we care about, of course, in AL amyloidosis is primarily organ recovery. And I say that because, of course, light chains are important, but nobody feels their light chains in the blood. What people feel with this is when the kidneys are impaired, when the heart is impaired, when the nerves are impaired, when the GI tract is impaired. And so, you know, one of the key endpoints to any drug treatment in, in amyloidosis is how effectively that drug facilitates recovery of organs that are damaged by amyloidosis. And so the study looked at cardiac response on the left, renal response on the right. And so you can see that in both those graphs, the rate of patients achieving response in those organs about doubled. So cardiac response was improved from 22% with Cyborg D to 42% when daratumumab was added. And then for renal response, similarly, went from 27% renal response when patients just got Cyborg D versus 54% when daratumumab was added. So at six months, organs were definitely improving more often in patients who got daratumumab. Um, and so to wrap up, you know, a lot of us, both patients, investigators, and everybody else with, with AL amyloidosis, we're all extremely excited about the approval um, of daratumumab in combination with Cyborg D. So as you can see here, this, this study resulted in the approval by FDA, EMA, so the European Medical Association or Medication Association, Medical Association, um, and other countries. So great that we have the first drug that's been approved in amyloidosis. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is that the big unanswered questions, you know, any good study always leads to more questions for us to think about. And I think a lot of us in amyloidosis um, are really wondering about a number of questions that have arisen out of the Andromeda study. And one big one, of course, is how stem cell transplant fits in. The Andromeda study did not incorporate stem cell transplant. Stem cell transplant is still arguably a standard of care for treating amyloidosis. And that study really doesn't answer the question of whether we should still be doing stem cell transplant or whether the incorporation of daratumumab means that it's time to start thinking about retiring stem cell transplant. And then the other one, which is probably a little bit less critical, but the, the question of whether or not we can use this Andromeda tested regimen for, for a specifically advanced cardiac light chain amyloidosis, or I should say other forms of amyloidosis like renal only that don't involve the heart. The Andromeda study really only tested daratumumab in mild to moderate heart amyloidosis. It didn't look at it in these other scenarios. And so it's a question of how far we want to extrapolate the data. And I think that's all I have. And we thank you very much. We have lots of DARA questions for you and other questions as well. And we'll take those after we hear some of them after we hear from Dr. Rubenstein. Uh, so Dr. Rubenstein, you're going to talk about some other treatments. Yes. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so uh, DARA Cyborg D, which Dr. Tuckman talked about, is definitely the standard of care for frontline management of uh, of AL amyloidosis. Uh, however, um, uh, a minority of patients, but a not insignificant minority of patients, 20% of patients don't have very deep 
hematologic responses to the Darasibor D. And then some patients eventually will have their disease relapse uh, after initially responding to the Darasibor D. So I'm gonna talk about some of the therapies that are widely used in, in those two settings. Um, one emerging uh, therapy that a lot of us in the community are very excited about is uh, venetoclax. So venetoclax is a drug that's used to treat a lot of different um, blood disorders. Uh, and the way it works is essentially by interfering with this molecule called BCL2. Uh, so BCL2 is a molecule that helps cancer cells evade a process called apoptosis, which is essentially a cellular program uh, that tells the cell to die. Um, it's, it's common for cancer cells and, and cells and clonal disorders like, like light chain amyloidosis um, to uh, have ways to evade the program cell death pathway. Um, and one of them is by overexpressing this molecule called BCL2. That, that means they make a little too much of it and are likelier to avoid cell death. Uh, venetoclax basically blocks that. It's the, the um, teal, I guess that's a rhombus. I'm not sure. I'm not as good with shapes as I am with medicine, but this is venetoclax. It interferes with BCL2 um, and facilitates death of the amyloid protein producing cell. This is really important in AL amyloidosis because fully 50% of patients with AL amyloidosis harbor this 1114 translocation. So just to back up and explain what that means. So the chromosomes are the structures in the cell where all the DNA and programs that tell the cell what to do live. And sometimes two of those chromosomes are fused together and they cause that cell to behave a little differently than a normal cell. So in patients with AL amyloidosis, 50% of the plas of, of the patients will have this abnormality um, uh, where the 11th and 14th chromosomes are mashed up, and that results in a lot of expression of BCL2. So blocking BCL2 in patients with this abnormality is uh, a, an approach that we're all very excited about. We don't have uh, as much high quality data here as we do in the frontline setting. Um, uh, Andromeda was, I believe, the second randomized trial ever, ever done in the light chain amyloid space. Um, so uh, more research on this is ongoing, but early data is uh, very encouraging uh, as to the efficacy of this approach. So here you have a small trial that was published in the British Journal of Hematology. It's nine patients who are receiving venetoclax-based therapy. Um, uh, the different colors on the graph here indicate um, depth of response. As you can see, three out of nine achieved a complete hematologic response, which means normalization of M protein or light chains. Um, and then two more patients responded. So greater than 50% of patients whose amyloid had already resisted a frontline therapy had a response to this agent. Um, what about the 50% of patients who do not harbor that abnormality? I'm going to change my share here real quick. Um, so a standard of care for patients that don't harbor the 1114 in their amyloid producing cells is to use a class of drug called the immunomodulatory drugs. So uh, the mechanism of how those drugs work uh, is shown here. And despite the name, it's actually not by modulating the immune system. So essentially this molecule called the proteasome uh, is the garbage can of the cell. It's where all the um, misfolded proteins and other um, waste, waste products and byproducts are disposed of. And essentially the imids help chaperone various other molecules and, and throw them in the garbage, including some that result in aggressive uh, uh, behavior of the cell and, and rapid cell growth. Uh, so uh, the molecule that they throw in the garbage in amyloid is this molecule called Icarose. Um, and that's the mechanism by which the imid, which is the purple, uh, again, trapezoid rhombus, what have you, um, uh, on this picture. Uh, and that's been shown also to result in, in a, a, a good proportion of patients achieving control over disease after it's relapsed. So here's an Italian study from Dr. Palladini's group uh, that looked at patients uh, receiving pomalidomide, 
uh, which is one of the immunomodulatory drugs uh, for relapse light chain amyloidosis. And what you see is that after six cycles of therapy, a majority of patients have achieved at least a partial response and approximately 20% of patients has, have received a very good partial response, which essentially means that the vast majority of the amyloid producing protein has, um, has been eradicated. 55% um, uh, of patients uh, had uh, over time a durable uh, partial response or better. That's shown in this, this graph here, which is called a waterfall graph. Um, and the patients who had a response uh, had a much better probability of survival as shown on these, uh, these bottom graphs here. Uh, these are patients with cardiac disease. These are patients with renal disease. So both pomalidomide and venetoclax, which work in different ways, can be effective at controlling uh, disease for patients with light chain amyloidosis who either are refractory to the first line therapy, meaning that the first line therapy hasn't worked, or they've relapsed. A key point is that the venetoclax treatment is only uh, useful for, uh, for patients that have this 1114 translocation, which is about 50% of patients. So not all patients with amyloidosis qualify for or should receive that agent. But um, for those who do, it can be a very effective treatment. I think that's all the time that I have. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask our physicians to kind of be a Q and A panel right now, okay? And, and Bob, can you get the therapy chart up there? Because I have some questions specific to some of those, some of the therapies on the chart. And we're just gonna take a few minutes to answer these questions. We have some <clears throat> more time set aside for Q and A later, but there's, there's kind of some pressing questions here that um, asked. And one of them is on the, um, if you look at, at the chart, you'll see under proteasome inhibit inhibitors, we've been talking about Velcade or Bortezomib, part of the Cyber-D you know, cocktail. But we have some people that have sent in questions about Carfilzomib, also known as Kyprolis. And we need our, our cardiologist down here, Dr. Lyle, if you're, if you're, if you're on there as well. Um, and the, the question that when we uh, had a webinar a few months ago, Dr. Suzanne Lynch from Columbia said I should take Kyprolis or Kyprolis off the chart. As far as she was concerned, this was not a good drug for AL amyloidosis and she didn't like it at all. And then when I brought it up to some other physicians at a later webinar, they all said, leave it on. It, it might be good if nothing else works. And because of cardiac toxicity. So I was wondering if we could get the opinions of, uh, we don't have Dr. Um, um, Zonder joining us yet, but I'd like to get your opinion, Dr. Tuckman, and yours, Dr. Rubenstein, and Dr. Lyles, as well as a cardiologist, and how she feels about the carfilzomib kyprolis drug. Sure, Sam, do you wanna go first or you want me? Sure, I'll go first. So yeah. I will tell you that I personally have not used carfilzomib to treat a patient with AL amyloidosis. And the reason for that is that it's, it has the, a potential to cause a variety of different cardiac events. And many patients with light chain amyloidosis have cardiac involvement at baseline, and one would think are at higher risk for those toxicities. However, I'm not dogmatically opposed to using it. Uh, there are patients who have renal-only amyloidosis or um, amyloidosis involving other organ systems who have preserved cardiac function. And for those patients, I would consider using it as a later line therapy. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, carfilzomib has a similar mechanism of action, the bortezomib or Velcade. And although in the myeloma space, it's been shown to work after Velcade, um, it probably makes a little more sense in my view when patients uh, have a relapse, which is the space in which you'd use it, to switch the strategy up a little more um, uh, divergently from a mechanistic perspective. So I, I would envision using this in the third line or later for patients who don't have significant cardiac involvement, um, but I personally have not ever done so. I'm just, I'm open to using it in that space. And I'd say, so I completely agree with those comments. So I have used it a decent amount, um, both on some of the studies that have been done with carfils and been AL in the past, and then also outside of clinical studies. 
Um, and I would say it's, it's, I mean, you know, never say never in medicine. And I would say this is no exception. I'd say that carfilzomib, for all the reasons that Sam just mentioned, is certainly not a preferred drug in AL. It's never been shown to be better than anything else. Um, there is certainly that cardiac toxicity issue, which can be especially problematic in AL. Um, but for a situation where somebody has been through all of the other um, treatment options and we really need something, then you know, it's one of those circumstances where we may use it and we may, you know, have a long discussion about the safety versus the fact that we need to do something. And then if we do it, monitor extremely closely. So I wouldn't, I would, I would not necessarily advocate for taking it completely off the list, but I would agree that this is, you know, sort of a third, fourth line agent and not one that we're using very commonly in AL. The last thing I will say, and I'll echo all of what Sasha just said, Dr. Tuckman just said, um, this is a great use case for having a multidisciplinary team to help you manage light chain amyloidosis. So um, I would not give this agent to just about any patient with light chain amyloidosis without having a cardiologist help me think through whether that's advisable. And it helps to have a, a cardiologist that you work with regularly who has some familiarity with the disease, the treatments we use and their side effects. So uh, I definitely think, um, uh, before using this agent, the consultation with the cardiologist in the vast majority of, of cases would be helpful. And speaking and, of cardiologist, Dr. Yeah. Lyle? Yes, so absolutely. I echo those comments as well, that we don't frequently see it used, but in the cases where we have had to use it, I'm seeing the patient much more frequently. And I think that multidisciplinary approach is so is so key that we're going to increase our monitoring so that we can pick up on side effects earlier. And I think that uh, the multidisciplinary approach, keeping me in the loop or the cardiologist in the loop is very important. Okay, and we had another question come in about the drug. What if you do not have cardiac involvement? Have you seen after someone has been given this drug that it has caused cardiac issues? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a small number of people. And so it's especially not been used much in amyloidosis, but some of the studies have shown it. And then I can say that in my experience of giving it to patients outside of clinical studies, yes, we see it. It's relatively uncommon. So I really would look at this as all the other speakers have said, is something that we need to be cautious about and watch out for, but it's not such a high rate that it's one of those drugs that I would absolutely never use in the circumstance. So yes, I've seen it, but nonetheless, I'd still use it in appropriate circumstances after a thorough discussion with the patient. And I'll, I'll say, you know, I've, I, I, I fessed up, I've not used it in a, uh, to help treat a patient with amyloidosis, but I've used it very widely to treat multiple myeloma and certainly patients who appear to have no cardiac risk factors, again, rarely, but I've had those patients develop cardiac events on carfilzomib if you're not, if you're not careful. Um, so um, uh, if you're not careful, that is to say you could, you could miss that. So um, definitely could happen in a patient without cardiac involvement at baseline. Muriel. Yes. Hi, uh, Dr. Learn. Hi. Sorry, I, I just finished round, so I'm joining you guys a little late. Patients first, we understand that. Um, you know, I, I agree with all the panelists, um, but, um, but, you know, these drugs are all, you know, uh, potentially um, harmful drugs. And, and one thing that we need to remember is that ortizomib has been shown to cause cardiac toxicity too in AL amyloidosis. So, isn't, so you know, nothing is ever absolute. Um, I have used uh, carfilzomib um, to treat my patients. And, and I think um, what Dr. Uh, Tuckman said is absolutely right. And, and Dr. Rubenstein, that we wouldn't use it as a first line, but as the patient become resistant to um, other therapies, I've had a patient who is uh, on her fourth line and she's doing beautifully on, uh, carfilzomib right now. And it's probably saving her life because we don't have anything else for her. So, so I think, you know, uh, toxicity is always one of the things that we um, worry about when we treat patients uh, and especially amyloid patients because they're more frail, but, but to just say, oh, carfilzomib is bad for the heart. We're forgetting that, um, you know, uh, a small percentage of patients develop cardiomyopathy on bortezomib. Okay, very good. Thank you so much.
on to some Dara questions now. Now we're aware that in the Andromeda trial, there was a it was two years that people had treatment with the daratumumab. People are asking, what about longer than two years? Is it safe? Um, when do we when do we stop doing maintenance on daratumumab? So we'll start with you, Dr. Tuckman, on that. Um, so I'd say that the first and foremost that this has not really been tested. So any anything we say about this is really a guess based on available data and extrapolation. Um, but I'd say that this is sort of a difference in philosophy between different people who manage amyloidosis, those, uh, those who believe that it's just sort of a different version of multiple myeloma versus others who believe that biologically it really is a different entity. And what I mean by that is that in multiple myeloma, maintenance has really been shown to be the standard. It clearly keeps the disease under control for longer. And more importantly, it's been shown to help patients live longer with multiple myeloma. So there, it's clearly the gold standard. That's never really been tested, much less proven in amyloidosis. And for a number of reasons that we didn't have time to discuss today, I'd say that the, for biological reasons, those findings in multiple myeloma are quite likely not relevant to amyloidosis specifically. Um, and so I personally really believe that you know, things have toxicity and if there's not a proven benefit to it, then we really should think about not doing it even if somehow it feels right. Um, and so given that at maintenance has really never been proven in amyloidosis, including on the Andromeda study, I typically use it as, as prescribed per the Andromeda study, which is to say up to two years and then think about stopping. Uh, but I do not routinely do maintenance, at least in frontline treatment for amyloidosis. Second line, if somebody is on daratumumab as part of relapse therapy, then we have a discussion about the pros and cons of continuing it indefinitely. But to the question about how to sort of apply Andromeda to a maintenance strategy, I do not routinely do it, but I'd certainly be interested in hearing what the others on the panel think about that. I, I'm completely in alignment on that. Um, so the rationale for maintenance in general and in, in amyloidosis, as Dr. Tuckman points out, is not as, on as firm ground as maintenance in myeloma, both conceptually and in terms of hard clinical data. I'll also add that even in the myeloma space, uh, daratumumab monotherapy may not be that good of a maintenance drug anyway. Uh, there, I don't want to uh, go too off, off target topic here, but um, I, I even consider stopping it early if patients have had um, evidence of an organ response already. Um, I, I have that discussion with patients after one year. Um, I think daratumumab is a relatively easy drug to give in the spectrum of, of these, these types of therapies. It doesn't have that many side effects, but one that's particularly salient in this age is that it can uh, impair our body's ability to respond to vaccinations. So that's a real consideration uh, in the pandemic. And if a patient's organ is already responding uh, because maintenance is you know, not as proven to benefit patients in amyloid as in myeloma, I, I have a discussion with uh, patients stopping it even earlier than two years, personally. Dr. Learn? You know, I, I heard the question a little bit differently. Um, the, I think the, the person asked if it's safe to go beyond two years. And, um, and I think it is. I mean, we do have some patients that have been on it for longer than two years, but I totally agree with uh, Dr. Tuckman and Dr. Rubenstein that we're not sure that there's any evidence that um, it is beneficial after two years. Um, and I um, further agree with Dr. Rubenstein that there are patients that you might be able to even stop sooner than the two years, although that's how this Andromeda study was designed. It was for two years and and you know you you kind of go with what the evidence is, but but certainly there are, you know, especially in this pandemic um, where we're seeing patients that don't respond to um, vaccination at all, that you, you have to balance the, uh, the benefit with, with um, the adverse effects. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, whether it's safe, yes, I think it's probably safe to go on beyond two years. Whether it's beneficial is not known. And and probably that you're going to get the most out of it. Um, you know what Dr. Rubenstein was alluding to is the the myeloma data that um, the benefits might be we, uh, 
waning after um, a year or so. So uh, we just don't know. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Lyle and Dr. Learn, this question I think would be for you both. Okay, this person just started daratumumab mad cyber D has stage two heart and stage one kidney. And the reported after six months, this person's experiencing trembling, shaking and balance issues. Would this be side effects from the, um, from the cyber D dara or what, what are your thoughts on that? Dr. Learn, Dr. Lyle. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure if that would necessarily be a cardiac side effect with the trembling. It'd be a little difficult to tease out without having a little more information. Um, sometimes with the infusions and the chemotherapy, we do see people that become volume overloaded and we have to adjust their diuretics, but I'm not sure the trembling I could contribute to a cardiac side effect. Dr. Lauren, if you had any additional thoughts. Any kidney side effects from the, that would involve trembling, Dr. Lauren? No, no. I mean, um, you know, you, when I see trembling in my patients and, and Dr. Tuckman and Dr. Rubenstein can certainly um, comment, but I always think steroid first. Um, is it too much steroids for them? Because uh, that can cause them to uh, have a little bit of tremors. Um, the imbalance, uh, you know, are they getting neuropathy from the Valcade? Um, and that's why they're starting to lose their balance a little bit. Now, of course, this is all also difficult because AL amyloidosis can cause neuropathy too. So is it a progression of the AL amyloidosis? Is it um, uh, toxicity from the Valcade? But it's certainly not a uh, kidney side effect. I would totally agree with what Dr. Lauren just said. Uh, I would um, question whether it was the steroids causing the, the tremulous um, uh, symptom. And, you know, Velcade uh, definitely can cause neuropathy, which can manifest in a variety of different ways. So I'd think about tweaking, uh, depending on this granular details, I'd think about tweaking the doses of those agents in response to that symptom. Okay, we'll make this the last question before we go on to um, Dr. Learn's presentation, okay? Um, this person is um, new, to, new to the disease. Uh, he's under 40, and he wants to know if it makes sense to hold off on cyclophosphamide for the very early stage disease in a younger patient. And he also wants to know um, if, if the daratumumab along with prednisone and Velcade is reasonable for first line treatment. Dr. Tuckman. Um, so there's a lot of, we don't know behind that question. I mean, I'd say that a lot of these things have not really been tested. They're probably fine, but it's just, we don't have data to prove it. And I'm sort of a stickler for the data. I tend to sort of, as Dr. Luring was saying earlier with Andromeda, that's the, the study was given in that one way. And so that's the one way that we know that that regimen works. And once we start deviating from that game plan, then it may work as well, but it may also not. Um, and so to the cyclophosphamide question, I mean, there have been a couple of studies looking at cyclophosphamide and at least those early smaller studies have not necessarily shown that adding that including cyclophosphamide um, with a bortezomib or velcade dexamethasone combination does much. But on the other hand, the much larger studies have included cyclophosphamide. And in general, it's a relatively easy agent to tolerate. And so I'd have a pretty high threshold to drop it, meaning I wouldn't necessarily encourage it unless we had a good reason to. Um, and then what was the other part of the question again? What about prednisone? This person oh, prednisone. referencing prednisone rather than dexamethasone. Yeah, so that's another unknown. So we do substitute prednisone sometimes if people are really having trouble on dexamethasone. And they're both, so to the audience and those who don't know, they're both corticosteroids. And the reason that we use steroids in amyloidosis is that steroids kill amyloid cells directly. Um, dexamethasone is more potent. It gets into the system more quickly than prednisone. It also lasts longer than prednisone. And so uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a study looking at dexamethasone versus prednisone. And so again, much like the earlier point, it's something that makes sense. It should work in the sense that they're both steroids. And so why wouldn't prednisone work? But given that it's not really been tested and 
dexamethasone is really tried and true in amyloidosis, I would not necessarily encourage switching. But that said, there could be very appropriate clinical circumstances in which case I would do it. So without knowing the individual details on this patient, it's really on this person, it's really tough for me to, to say whether I would do that personally. But in general, I do not regularly switch from dex to prednisone, I'd say. Okay, and the fact that this patient is under 40, you don't feel that the treatment for someone under 40 would be that much different from someone over 40? No, not necessarily. I mean, either way, we want to we want to maximally control the amyloidosis. And, you know, there are other concerns that could come up that we could think about, but, you know, the, the proven regimen and right now is Daratim and Abcibor D, so I'd, I'd, I'd really hesitate for messing with that unless we had a good reason to. Okay, great. And now, um, Dr. Learn, if you're ready, we will, uh, people are very much looking forward to this presentation on dialysis and kidney transplants. So take it away. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Okay, so, hello, Mariel. Thank you for um, uh, arranging this uh, meeting today. And um, so uh, today um, I was assigned the topic of renal replacement therapy for uh, renal amyloidosis. And uh, so, so um, I think most of you are aware that kidney is one of the major organs that um, are affected in patients with AL amyloidosis. Uh, this is an older study that Dr. Kyle and Dr. Gertz did. Um, and in this uh, study, um, they looked at different syndromes. So nephrotic syndrome, um, renal insufficiency, meaning loss of kidney function, congestive heart failure, peripheral neuropathy, and et cetera. And as you can see, um, patients uh, with nephrotic syndrome, which is the syndrome that occurs when you start losing a lot of protein um, and renal insufficiency uh, make up over 50% of the presentation of these patients. Now, Dr. Mutar from our group um, did an update on um, the involvement and he looked at it a little bit differently instead of by syndrome he looked at it by organs and by organ uh the heart came in first um single organ involvement was about 19 percent. but if you take um uh multiple organs um with heart involvement then um this goes up close to uh, 80 percent whereas kidney um uh, is around 60%. Now we know that um, kidney involvement is a risk factor for progressing to dialysis. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this graph, um, the uh, y-axis here um, is for those who have um, uh, kidney failure or had progressed to dialysis. And as you can see uh, over time, um, and this study was uh, some patients we had followed for over 15 years, you see that over time, the patients steadily progressed to NSH kidney disease or being uh, on dialysis or requiring kidney transplant. And in this study, 45% of the patients um, progressed. Now, the date of the study is 2009, which means that majority of these patients were not treated with novel agents. So on the right, this is another study done by Dr. Wong. Um, she did this when she was at Boston University. Dr. Wong is now at UCSF. Um, the study date uh, was 2017. So most of these patients actually were able to receive novel agent. But you see really the same pattern that over time, these patients do progress to end-stage uh, kidney disease. In this study, um, the rate of progression is 34%, which is a little bit less than our study at Mayo, but also the follow-up time was shorter. Um, and surprisingly, uh, two-thirds of the patients who achieved the BGPR or better, which is a very good partial response, continue to progress to end-stage kidney disease. So that's, um, that's not good for our patients. Um, and as we know that uh, Dr. Palladini and Dr. Castritas have uh, devised renal staging systems that uh, tries to predict what happens to patients' uh, kidney function over time. 
And <clears throat> Dr. Castritus uses two factors, the, the EGFR, which is calculated by, this is the estimated GFR calculated by the serum creatinine and protein urea at the time of diagnosis. And so just using these two risk factors, EGFR of less than 50 and the protein urea greater than five, he can separate into patients into three groups. So patients in group one have EGFR greater than 50 and protein urea less than uh, five grams a day. In group two, patients have one of these risk factors. In group three, they have both. And as you can see, in group one, they do very well. But patients in group three, about 30% of the patients uh, end up on dialysis uh, at about two years. Dr. Castritas used a slightly different system where he used an EGFR to proteinuria ratio. And if it's less than 30, those patients, again, do quite well. And if that ratio is greater than 100, um, then those patients uh, did poorly. So the stage three patients are the ones that are most likely to progress. Well, stage two do progress, but they progress kind of in between stage one and stage three. Now, Dr. Palladini and uh, Castritas both also have progression and response criteria. I'm only gonna show you Dr. Uh, Palladini's uh, model because um, they're both really similar. Um, so on this graph on the left, patients who have progression of kidney disease, and this is defined by um, a loss of kidney function by 25% measured by the EGFR, these patients do worse than patients who do not have um, kidney progression. So again, um, this graph is for patients who require dialysis. So the higher it is, the more patients requiring dialysis. And as you can see um, in patients who progress by kidney disease, uh, they progress to dialysis over time. On the other hand, patients who responded have a kidney response after therapy, which is represented by this line down here. Most of those patients don't progress to uh, NSH kidney disease. In fact, their, their kidney function is maintained whereas patients who do not meet um, response criteria will continue to progress. Now, Dr. Palladini also looked at um, the hematologic response and how that relates to the preservation of kidney function. And what he found was that patients who had a BGPR or better, which is represented by this bottom line, did better in terms of um, preserving kidney function than the patients who do not achieve a BGPR or better. Now, I think that um, most everyone is very familiar with this. The, the um, results from the Andromeda trial where Andromeda, because it's able to achieve such a high rate of hematologic response, um, over 80% of the patients had a VGPR. This translated to unprecedented organ responses. Um, in fact, basically it doubled the organ responses to all the previous studies using just Cyborg D alone. And in fact, in the study, 80% um, of the patients had a renal response that were measurable. So the question is, how do patients, how are we um, getting these great responses and yet I showed you curves that uh, patients continue to progress to end-stage kidney disease. Um, and in Dr. Wong's study, even in patients who um, had a BGPR, still progressed to um, dialysis. And I think the study out of the UK is very insightful. So this study uh, was done by the UK amyloid group. And they looked at patients who had stage three kidney disease um, by the Palladini criteria. And what they found uh, were two things. One, um, you definitely need a 90% reduction of the DFLC. And this DFLC um, is the involved free light chain. So your bad free light chain minus your uninvolved free light chain, the good one. <clears throat> 
And that's what gives you the difference, the, the DFLC. And what you need is a 90% reduction of the DFLC in order to retain your kidney function. But that's not it. What they then looked at was, was there a difference in terms of how quickly that this DFLC goal was achieved? And what they found um, is very telling that only patients who uh, were able to achieve that DFLC reduction by 90%, and you could look at this DFLC of 90% reduction as VGPR, they're, they're pretty close. So only patients who, who achieve this 90% reduction of the DFLC or achieve a VGPR within three months were able to preserve their kidney function. What is really um, disheartening is the fact that patients who achieve this goal at 12 months all progress to uh, end-stage kidney disease or dialysis, which means that the kidney, um, you know, we, we oftentimes um, concentrate on looking at the uh, heart response in terms of our therapy, and rightly so. Um, you, uh, the heart is the most important organ um, in terms of um, AL amyloidosis, but kidney actually has the same thing that if they don't, if we don't achieve a rapid response and a deep response within the first three months, in the patients that are in stage three, um, that their chances of preserving kidney function is pretty low. Now, um, this, uh, this group is not made up of just AL patients, so I'm gonna talk about some other patients too. Um, this is uh, ALEC2. Um, I don't know if we have anyone um, in the audience today with ALEC2 amyloidosis. ALEC2 is um, uh, much better. Um, ALEC2 is a uh, amyloid that affects um, uh, specific populations, um, uh, Hispanic, Middle Easterners, Indians. Um, and the prognosis for ALEC2 patients are generally much better. Um, this is a study done by uh, Dr. Uh, Said uh, at the Mayo Clinic looking at ALEC2 patients. And it really depends on what your kidney function was at the time of diagnosis. If the patient had uh, a serum creatinine of less than two, none of the patients progressed to dialysis within 72 months of follow-up. However, if the creatinine is greater than two, which is represented by this blue line, you see that the progression to um, dialysis is pretty quick. Um, those that have a creatinine that's abnormal, but um, under two um, have um, intermediate uh, prognosis. And then there are patients with AA amyloidosis. Unfortunately, um, this is a study um, out of uh, Italy looking at AA amyloidosis patients as compared to AL. And the AA amyloidosis patients um, really have very similar prognosis from the kidney standpoint um, as to AL. And in fact, in this study, the median time to dialysis is actually a little bit shorter. Um, the good news is that uh, like in AL amyloidosis, the treatment for AA amyloidosis uh, have improved quite significantly um, over the 14 years since this publication. So uh, the prognosis might be a little bit better these days, um, but this is, uh, you know, the, some of the data that I can find. Now, um, nobody wants to talk about this, but um, unfortunately, this is a reality that some patients will progress to the need for renal replacement therapy in the first line of renal replacement therapy, of course, is dialysis. Um, and and uh, what patients need to realize is that there is some preparation that needs to be done um, when deciding on dialysis. Um, and that's because there are different types of dialysis, which I will go over with you in a little bit. If the patient chooses hemodialysis, this is where we take the blood out and clean it, then we need to look at um, access. Access is the device 
that allows us to take the blood out and return the blood to the body. The best uh, device um, or access in non-amyloid patients is the fistula. And I'll go over what a fistula is in a little bit. The second is considered to be the graft, the AV graft, and the last is the catheter. Now I have to tell you that, um, as I said, this is for non-amyloid patients. For amyloid patients, we actually don't know which is the best uh, access. And one of the issues with the fistula and graft is that um, the fistula and graft bypasses um, the normal vasculature. And it actually requires increased cardiac output in order to make these functional. And um, as we all know, some patients uh, with ALM lidosis have cardiac uh, disease. And some of these patients may not be able to keep up with the cardiac demand that these uh, devices need. The other thing is that fistula and graft do not perform well in patients with low blood pressure. And we all know that a lot of ALM with patients have low blood pressure. And so while a lot of times the dialysis unit push for this because this is what um, the, uh, the um, NIDDK recommends, this is what uh, the National Kidney Foundation recommends, this is what the government recommends. Again, these recommendations were based on non-amyloid patients and not amyloid patients, and amyloid patients may not uh, benefit from these. Now, the other um, major dialysis modality is the peritoneal dialysis, and in that case, you need to have a PD catheter placed. Now, in other countries, the PD uh, peritoneal dialysis can start right away after placement of the catheter, in the United States, however, the practice is generally to wait a few uh, days to weeks. Um, at the Mayo Clinic, we're, we're really conservative. We typically wait four weeks. At other centers, they may make, wait one to two weeks before starting. But very few centers in the United States actually do what um, our colleagues do in uh, Asia or in Europe, where they can start right away within an hour, okay? So this is the um, hemodialysis access, um, the fistula and the graft. Now, normally blood goes through the artery, um, transverse, you know, goes through the capillaries and then return um, by vein. And what happens when it goes through the capillaries is that a lot of the pressure is taken away. And so veins generally have low pressure um, is a low pressure system. But as you can see, what they do with the fistula is they take a vein and sew it directly into the artery. And what that does is that it makes this vein a high pressure system. That high pressure causes the vein to thicken. And once it gets thick enough, we can poke it repeatedly with the needle and it will heal up. So normally this vein with the low pressure system, you poke it a few times and it'll just scar up. With the high, when, once it becomes a high pressure system, um, fistulas can uh, work for years. In fact, I, I know patients with fistulas that are functional after 15, 20 years. So, so that's a fistula. Um, but remember again, because we bypass the capillary, all that blood is now returning to the heart. And the heart has to be able to um, uh, accommodate that uh, blood return, the higher amount of blood returning to the heart and also need to pump that blood out. So that's why the cardiac output has to increase. And I'm sure Dr. Lyle can give a much better explanation as to the cardiac physiology than I. The graph is used when patients don't have good veins. So we need a, um, a, a minimum um, diameter vein in order to sew into the artery. 
So if a patient doesn't have very good veins, then we put in this artificial uh, tubing that will connect the artery to the vein. Now, this is second best because this is artificial tubing. And so while it has all the same limitations as the fistula, meaning that the heart has to be able to tolerate it, um, and, and actually also that you have to have good enough circulation to do it, because this is an artificial device, it can get infected. So whereas the fistula infection rate is extremely low, the graft can be infected, but it is lower than the catheter. So this is the device that a lot of people call it a port, um, but it's a catheter that is used to um, uh, dialyze patients. And this is the way that we dialyze patients acutely. So when someone needs dialysis immediately, we have to put in a catheter because for the graft to develop, it generally takes about four to six weeks. And for the fistula, it takes about one to two weeks. But this, a catheter, we can use right away. Now, the problem with the catheter is that the infection risk goes up. In fact, each time we open these ports to connect, um, there's a slight risk of infection. And this is the problem, which I think um, Dr. Lyle um, uh, knows more than anyone. The end of the catheter is sitting in the heart, um, usually in the atrium, right next to the valve. And any infection that um, becomes bloodborne can, can have a direct pathway right to the valve. And, and um, can cause endocarditis uh, in these patients. So that's why it, for those of you who are on dialysis or those who are um, uh, getting close to dialysis, your nephrologist is probably telling you to get a fistula or a graft because of the infection uh, issues that are related to the tunnel catheter. Okay. Now, the different types of dialysis. The most common type of dialysis is in-center hemodialysis, where the patient goes to a dialysis center, um, typically three times a week for about uh, anywhere between three and four hours at a time. Um, and uh, there are definitely advantages and disadvantages. The advantages um, are that no training is required. Um, uh, you know, uh, we remember all those uh, uh, cookware commercial where you press it and forget it. Um, this is pretty much the same thing. You show up, you give them your arm or your catheter and the nurse uh, will uh, connect you to the machine and it gets going and you, uh, the patients typically take a nap or watch TV or play on the computer. Uh, nothing is required. Everything is taken care of for you. However, there are some disadvantages. One is that um, uh, dialysis are set hours. It's like having a, a job. You have to show up on time um, or else you may not get in. Um, and so that is uh, a bit inconvenient. Um, some patients might not live close to a dialysis center. And so the travel time can be a difficult thing, especially for people living in rural areas. Some I've heard um, patients uh, driving 150 miles each way to a dialysis center. Um, if you travel to visit family or go on vacation, you have to make arrangements to make sure that there's a dialysis center where you're going. And, um, and it's not available in all places. Uh, so for example, if you want to go to uh, Yellowstone, um, you know, I think Cody might be the closest uh, place where there's dialysis. There's nothing in the park. So um, the physical location may be a um, problem. The other um, is uh, peritoneal dialysis. Actually, this actually is not peritoneal. This is home um, hemodialysis. Uh, and home hemodialysis, uh, actually, hang on. Um, no, this is peritoneal dialysis, sorry. In peritoneal dialysis, um, this is done at home. So you have two different types of peritoneal dialysis. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, called the Cycler, and it's a machine that you program. You put the dialysate on the machine, and the machine automatically infuses and drains um, the fluid from the belly. So in peritoneal dialysis, um, the way it works is that fluid is infused into the belly. It sits in there for a while, and that fluid sucks out the toxins, and then after some time, you drain it. So you can do it the way this person is doing it, and this is called um, uh, um, CAPD, which is the uh, ambulatory type of um, peritoneal dialysis where you actually do manual exchanges. So you hook up a bag to a, um, a hook or, or a device that holds the bag up and it drains in by gravity. And then you have another drain bag, which, or you put this bag on the ground when it's time to drain and it drains out by gravity. This one, the machine has a pump that pumps it for you. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? One, um, it's performed at home, so you don't have to travel anywhere. Um, and so if you live very far away from a dialysis center, that's not a problem. The dialysis um, bags are delivered to your home. Um, the hours are flexible. You can choose when you start dialysis and when you end. Um, most people usually are free during the day, so they don't have any fluid in the belly, although some patients may uh, require uh, fluid in the belly during the day. And um, it gives you the ability to travel. I had a patient who used to camp uh, every weekend and, and he does the cycler at home because the cycler requires electricity to run. And then when he goes camping, he does the CAPD where um, he just uh, puts a bag on a hook and on the back of his truck, he does dialysis and he doesn't have, he can camp all weekend without leaving the campground. There are some disadvantages. You do it yourself. Um, you know, there's nobody who comes and do this for you at home. So you have to be able to uh, hook up the, um, the bags to your catheter. Um, but this is pretty easy. I had a patient who was legally blind um, his vision is 2,400 or something. Um, and what he did was he hooked up a, a camera to his computer and he magnified it. And with that, um, he was able to hook up um, his peritoneal dialysis. So yes, it does take uh, some um, expertise and it, it also requires some training to do it um, septically. So aseptically, so you, you don't infect it, but, but it can be done and it's, it's quite easy once you get it. Patients with peritoneal dialysis catheter cannot go swimming in a pond or a lake. You can go swimming in the ocean. Um, chlorinated pools are okay, but uh, ponds are um, definitely not recommended and hot tubs probably not recommended as well. The peritoneal membrane, so these are the membranes inside the abdomen can wear out. And so some patients who start peritoneal dialysis may not be able to continue it and have to switch to hemodialysis. And you need some storage space for the, the uh, bags. Now, what about travel? Well, um, I had a patient who booked a round the world cruise on peritoneal dialysis. And um, the cruise ship allowed them to ship an entire pallet of peritoneal dialysis fluid on board, um, uh, they told me that they watched the pallet of uh, dialysis solution load onto the ship before they got on so that they know that they had dialysis and it was a uh, around the world cruise. So you can uh, plan cruises. By the way, there are dial dialysis cruises too. So there are cruise ships that have dialysis machines that can do uh, hemodialysis. And then this is home dialysis. Um, this uh, gives a combination of uh, kind of both the peritoneal dialysis and the hemodialysis. Um, the hemodialysis um, is, is a machine that runs at home, especially uh, modified for home use. So in the old days, you used to get one of the uh, machines that are in the dialysis centers. 
but those machines require um, uh, extensive remodeling of the plumbing at the house because we use a lot of water and the drains have to be able to accommodate all that water being dumped. But these machines are um, newer and the bags are very similar to the peritoneal dialysis bags. And so there's a lot less, uh, there actually no plumbing modification is required. After, after um, the, the bags are filled with the waste, you just dump it down the toilet. The advantage again is um, you can do it at home. The hours are very flexible. Most home dialysis are done five days a week for about two to two and a half hours. So the time is shorter, but you do it more frequently. And patients love um, home dialysis. Uh, the disadvantage, however, is that it requires an assistant. So you cannot do it by yourself like in peritoneal dialysis. You need an actual assistant there while you're running the machine. Um, it, it does require you to arrange for in-center hemodialysis when you travel. And again, because you have all these bags of dialysis, you need adequate storage space. Now, the most important uh, part of this talk, and, and I, I think that most people would rather do is um, kidney transplant. And um, uh, one thing that I wanna say is that uh, kidney transplant is safe and when done in the right patients uh, can be uh, very successful. Um, this is just a study that we did looking at different ways of doing the kidney transplant. So these are patient survival curves. So um, uh, this uh, tells you how the patients did. And we did the, uh, we looked at patients that did the kidney transplant either before they had a stem cell transplant, after they had stem cell transplant, or just with chemotherapy. And what we found was that uh, it doesn't matter which way, um, they all got very good outcome as long as they had a good hematologic response. Um, this is a study uh, from, um, from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, really looking at patients who received the kidney transplant after they had an autologous stem cell transplantation. And as you can see, the patients did extremely well uh, for about eight years and then um, some death uh, uh, did occur after about 10 years and some of the kidney um, were lost after about eight years. But this is actually pretty good um, comparable to uh, patients um, on kidney transplant without um, AL amyloidosis. Um, this is a study out of Boston University. Um, and what, what is the important part of the study is that what they looked at was um, patients who had VGPR or CR, complete response. And um, what they found was that relapse is less if the patient um, achieved the VGPR before they underwent the kidney transplant. Um, and um, the survival was um, longer if you measured it from the time of diagnosis if the patient achieved a VGPR or better. However, the survival uh, um, from the kidney standpoint and from the recipient standpoint did not change very much um, at the, from measure from the time of transplant, um, whether the patient had a VGPR or better or not. Um, but the big thing is that recurrence is much less common if the patient had a VGPR. Um, first before they achieved the transplant. And uh, at the Mayo Clinic, we also looked at our um, population. Um, this was uh, about, uh, I think, 80 patients. And again, we found that the patients who had VGPR before they um, went to transplant did very well. Uh, we also had some patients that went to kidney transplant first, and then we treated the AL amyloidosis. And what it looks like is that for the first um, eight to uh, nine years, they did about the same, but the patients who were treated after the transplant probably did a little bit worse than the patients who were treated before the transplant. 
what we don't recommend is doing the transplant if you only had a partial response because those patients did much worse. Um, now, what about uh, patients with other types of amyloidosis? So um, many amyloidosis attack the kidney and one of them is fibrinogen A-alpha. And in um, fibrinogen A-alpha, these patients progress to end-stage kidney disease usually within about um, five to 10 years after diagnosis. Um, and in this study out of the UK, they had 12 patients undergo a kidney transplant. Three failed immediately due to surgical complications, so we can't count those. One failed due to uh, something called transplant glomerulopathy, which is a result of chronic rejection. And then of the three, um, uh, of the eight other transplant, three of them had a recurrence. And the median time to recurrence was six years. Um, and um, all three of those patients eventually lost their kidney transplant due to the recurrence. Now, they had one patient that um, had a combined liver kidney transplant. And in this patient, um, no recurrence occurred. Since then, there have been several more patients that underwent the combined liver kidney transplant. And in none of them, um, the uh, the recurrence occurred. Uh, however, the problem with the combined liver kidney transplant is that um, you're taking on a much more complicated surgery. And um, one organ transplant is complicated, two organ transplants is uh, doubly complicated because now you have to worry about the liver and the kidney at the same time. And it's a much larger surgery. So um, some patients may not be eligible for the liver transplant. So it's, it's not um, appropriate for everyone. And um, finally, I just want to say that we have done a patient preemptively with doing a liver transplant alone. Uh, so this patient was diagnosed um, very early with um, fibrogen A-alpha amyloid. The reason she was diagnosed early is because her brother also had it. So it, as soon as she had any um, protein in her urine, she was like, give me a kidney biopsy. And we diagnosed her very early. She still had normal kidney function and we did a uh, liver alone. And so far we have not detected uh, fibrinogen A amyloid in her kidney, uh, progression of the fibrinogen A amyloid in the kidney and her liver transplant is doing well. And so hopefully she won't need a kidney transplant. Um, I forgot, I thought I had a slide in here for ALEC2, um, but um, ALEC2 patients can also get kidney transplant. So far, there's been one case where ALEC2 was detected in the um, kidney allograph. This is the transplant. However, in this patient, um, a relative gave this patient the transplant. And we are not sure whether or not the ALEC2 in the kidney transplant came from the relative or the patient. In the other patients that received a kidney transplant, we have not detected um, recurrence so far. So that's all I have and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. That, that was fantastic. And we're going to go a little out of order here. What we're going to do is we're going to take a quick five-minute break. Then we'll have Dr. Lyle. And then we'll have, we have lots of questions for you, Dr. Learn. And, and in listening to your presentation today made me realize, if, if you'd be so kind, perhaps we could do a presentation maybe later on this summer just on renal amyloidosis. I think that would be really exciting. So I want to get you to publicly commit to do that right now. <laughs> yes, of course. Anything for you, Mario. Oh, bless your heart. Okay, we have witnesses. And uh, so we'll take a quick five minute break. We'll come back. We'll have Dr. Lyle do her presentation and then we'll have that Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Five minute break. Okay, are we ready to rock and roll? You know, anyone who's ever been to one of our webinars knows that we tend to go over long and we tend to go a little off the agenda and bear with us, okay? Um, 
these are not rehearsed and we love the fact that our doctors are always willing to give us extra time. So um, we'll do the best we can to try to get you, you know, home to wherever it is you have to go as soon as we can. Okay, now we're going to hear from the um, head of the amyloidosis cardiac program at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, Dr. Melissa Lyle. And Dr. Lyle, welcome. Thank you so much, Muriel. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again to Mariel and Paula and the whole amyloid support group. I'm so excited to be here. So I am going to be talking a little bit of a broad overview of how amyloid can affect your heart. So here are the things that I'll try to address. I'm going to briefly review the normal heart function so you can kind of understand what and how amyloid affects the heart how amyloid affects the heart, explanation of some of the tests that your doctors may be ordering for you, and then also try to answer some of your questions about how to know if your heart is getting better and what you can do to help your heart. So let's briefly start off with normal heart function. So as you all know, the heart is about the size of your left fist. It sits in the left side of your chest and it has four chambers, two top chambers, two bottom chambers. Those two top chambers are the right atrium and the left atrium. They're sort of the collecting chambers. They receive blood, they don't do a lot of pumping. And then the two bottom chambers are more of the pumping chambers. And this is the right ventricle and the left ventricle that you see here. So between the right atrium and the right ventricle, we have the tricuspid valve. And between the left atrium and the left ventricle, then we have the mitral valve. So I wanna briefly review the normal way that blood circulates through the body. So here's a normal heart. And after we've used up all of the oxygen and we had that deoxygenated blood, it gets drained back through the venous system to the right side of the heart. So here we'll follow a blood cell as it goes through the path. So this is deoxygenated blood getting drained back to the right atrium, right ventricle. Then it goes out through the pulmonary artery through to the lungs, and that's where it's going to pick up oxygen and become useful oxygenated blood again. So now you see that it's turned red and it's going from the left atrium to the left ventricle, out through the aort aortic valve, through the aorta, to everywhere it needs to go to perfuse our organs and supply them with appropriate blood supply. So how does amyloid affect the heart? Well, we've already had some great lectures on uh, treatment for amyloid. And as you all know, amyloid is a disorder of misfolded proteins. The, in AL amyloid, the bone marrow, the plasma cells in the bone marrow are overproducing the immunoglobulins, specifically the light chains. And the light chains are what is becoming misfolded, misshapen, and forming those amyloid fibrils. When I think about an insoluble amyloid fibril, I think of it as almost the consistency of a thin plastic rope that can weave in diff different organs. And in the setting of AL amyloid, anywhere from about 50 to 75% of patients can have cardiac involvement. So what exactly does the cardiac involvement in involve? So there's two different ways that amyloid affects the heart in AL amyloid. The first is an infiltrative process. And with that infiltrative process, those amyloid fibrils are weaving themselves into the heart muscle. And then the second way is actually direct light chain toxicity to the heart. So I'll show you a couple of diagrams. Here's a normal heart muscle contracting the way it should. The walls are nice and thin as they should be. And then you see these amyloid fibrils that are weaving themselves into the heart muscle. And this makes the heart thicker and stiffer than it should be. And then you can see the depiction of the heart here that these walls, both on the right ventricle and the left ventricular side, are much thicker and stiffer than the normal heart should be. So in addition to the amyloid fibrils infiltrating the heart muscle, I also mentioned the direct toxicity component. So what we see here is the amyloid fibrils have already infiltrated the heart muscle. And then we have the light chains that are actually becoming directly toxic to the heart muscle itself and the cells in the heart. And this can cause direct cell death. So 
when the heart becomes thicker and stiffer than it should be, we often hear this association with heart failure and amyloid. So just as a review, what to be on the lookout for heart failure symptoms? What does that mean? And what does it, how does it affect the body? So when we think about how blood circulates through, we know that blood is pumped out the left uh, ventricle being sort of the main pumping chamber of the heart. And so with that left ventricle being the main pumping chamber of the heart, when it's thicker and stiffer than it should be, the pressures in the left ventricle actually increase. And when the pressures in the left ventricle increase, then there is essentially a backup of pressure. So the pressures increase in the left ventricle, back up into the left atrium, and then the pressures back up into the lung. And as I mentioned earlier, as the blood flows through, if we have that backup of pressure in the left ventricle going back to the lungs, then that can back up all the way even into the right ventricle. In the lungs, when the pressure in those capillaries and vessels in the lungs get increased pressure, there's actually leakage of fluid that then can cause a buildup of fluid in the lungs and can cause shortness of breath. And this diagram depicts a normal heart. And then we see that increased left ventricular wall thickness and how the, it's more difficult to move blood forward. So there's a backup of pressure, a leakage of fluid causing fluid buildup in your lungs. So what are some of the other signs and symptoms of heart failure in general? Well, sometimes it can be very nonspecific and just fatigue. And then shortness of breath that can be caused from a variety of different things, but including that buildup of fluid in your lungs. Swelling, we call that edema. So you can see here from this depiction, swelling in your legs is one of the first signs of heart failure. And then also the inability to lay flat when you're going to sleep. We refer to this as orthopnea, but this can be a very clear sign of heart failure and where we need to adjust your diuretics or your water pills. Waking up gasping for air as you're sleeping, and then even a cough, a cough specifically at night when you lay flat related to that excess fluid. So we've talked a lot about heart failure and how those amyloid fibrils can lead to heart failure, but what about the electrical system of the heart? So this can also get affected with amyloid. The electrical system can be, have conduction problems causing bradycardia. So what is bradycardia? Well, bradycardia means that your heart rate is too slow. And occasionally you may even require a pacemaker. Tachycardia means a very fast heart rate. So there can be different abnormal heart rhythms coming from both the top and the bottom chamber of the heart in amyloid that need to be addressed. So atrial fibrillation, we'll talk a little bit more about atrial fibrillation, but atrial fibrillation is an irregular rhythm that comes from those upper chambers of the heart, specifically the left atrium causes those upper chambers not to be almost more quivering instead of actually pumping and moving blood forward. This is very common in amyloid. And then occasionally you can have uh, abnormal rhythms coming from the bottom chamber of the heart. And this is called a ventricular arith uh, arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia specifically. And sometimes your doctor may recommend a defibrillator. So defibrillators have actually been quite controversial in AL amyloid, but now we recommend making sure that you're being screened with a Holter monitor or some sort of ambulatory heart monitor on a yearly basis to look not only for atrial fibrillation, but these ventricular arrhythmias. And in the setting of recurrent ventricular tachycardia, there may be a role for a defibrillator, but it is on an individual basis. So let's talk a little bit more about atrial fibrillation just to explain what that is because there's some very important points in the setting of amyloid. So in a normal heart, we have our own intrinsic pacemaker. This is called the sinoatrial node. It sends out an electrical signal to the rest of the heart, sort of stopping at the AV node before it goes to the bottom chambers of the heart to tell them to beat. And so I like to think about this electrical current almost as if you're skipping a pebble in a pond and you get that really nice ripple effect. So you're having an electrical si signal that tells the heart to beat and it's very synchronous and very uh, a nice alignment. 
Now, in atrial fibrillation, though, it's sort of the opposite. It's almost as if you took a bucket of pebbles and dumped them into a lake. You're getting lots of different electrical signals that are causing a lot of erratic electrical activity. And so your heart rate can be faster and irregular. And the top chambers of the heart, as I mentioned earlier, are almost quivering instead of having a nice contraction. The big thing to be aware of if you do have atrial fibrillation in the setting of your AL amyloid is the risk of blood clots. So as that blood, as the top chambers of the heart are quivering, blood can become stagnant. And if the blood becomes stagnant, then there's a risk of clot formation. And so that puts you at very high risk for stroke. So with any evidence of atrial fibrillation, then blood thinners are very important. So making sure to always tell your doctor if you're starting to have palpitations or any feelings of irregularity, and then always making sure to have that annual monitor, at least annually, um, to, make, to evaluate and screen for atrial fibrillation because we want to get you on a blood thinner right away. I won't go into too much detail about how we treat atrial fibrillation because it really is on an individual basis and it also depends on the how advanced your, your amyloid cardiac involvement is. But occasionally we will need to control your rate. A lot of times patients with amyloid, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but a lot of times can't tolerate a very low heart rate. And so we don't want to lower the heart rate too much, but we also don't want your heart rate to be in the 130s and 140s because you'll feel very poorly. Occasionally, we'll try to keep someone in a normal rhythm, and we can do that with various different medications. Also, your doctor may talk to you about a, the need for a cardioversion or an electric shock if you're in atrial fibrillation to get you back into normal rhythm to improve maybe some of your symptoms. And the one thing that I want to make sure everyone takes away from this part of the talk is that it's very important if you have cardiac amyloid and you have concomitant atrial fibrillation and you're scheduled for a cardioversion, that you always have a transesophageal echocardiogram prior to that cardioversion, even if you've been on blood thinners. So when a patient without cardiac amyloid, we're able to actually do the cardioversion without a transesophageal echocardiogram if they've been on blood thinners continuously for three weeks prior. So what is a transesophageal echocardiogram? This is an invasive echo where we actually take a probe similar to an EGD probe or a colonoscopy probe, but it has an ultrasound on the tip of it. And this is then put down your throat so that we can get a much closer look at the heart and we evaluate for any clots. We need to make sure that there's no clots in the heart before we can safely do the cardioversion. If there's a clot in the heart and you're, you have a cardioversion, that would put you at risk for stroke. Actually, Dr. Martha Grogan had done um, a large study looking at about 100 patients with atrial fibrillation and cardiac amyloid who presented for a cardioversion, and they all had this transesophageal echocardiogram, or TEE for short. And actually, about 30% of patients still had a clot in their heart, even despite being on blood thinners. And that's why we always want to do that. So if your cardiologist recommends a cardioversion, just make sure that you have that test for prior. So what about some of the heart tests that your doctor is going to be ordering for your initial evaluation to see if there's cardiac involvement and also for monitoring? So I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and understanding what we look at from these tests. So we'll talk about the blood tests. We'll talk about some of the imaging studies, mostly focusing on echocardiography or the ultrasound of your heart. Cardiac MRI can be used as an adjunct for imaging. And then occasionally we do need a heart biopsy to initially make the diagnosis of AL amyloid with cardiac involvement. So let's talk about the blood tests first. So what are the blood tests that we use? Well, we get a troponin and either a BMP or an NT pro BMP. The reason why we get these blood tests is first off for staging purposes, but then also for thinking about progression of disease and monitoring. So what are these blood tests? Well, the troponin, troponin is a protein that's released from the heart muscle when the heart muscle has suffered some sort of de degree of injury. We often look at this in people that were concerned about a heart attack. But the troponin levels are increased in amyloid, just as a, a in relation to the amyloid fibril deposition in the heart muscle. So you, if you do go to the emergency department and you have a troponin that is drawn, doesn't necessarily mean that you're having a heart attack. It just is a reflection of the cardiac amyloid in your heart. 
And then the BMP or NT pro BMP. So this is a protein that's released in the heart in response to higher pressure. So as we saw from the earlier diagram, when the pressure in the heart is increased in amyloid, you can start to get increased values of these markers, which is a marker of heart failure. But these can vary up to 40% in a week. So we don't check them frequently. And also a minor change isn't concerning. It's more a trend over time. Looking to see, is this number increasing for you or is it improving as you've gotten on your hematologic uh, treatment? So these are some of the tests that your cardiologist and your physician may order. So just as kind of an overview of what to expect, the EKG is looking at the electrical system of the heart. The other thing that we look for is something called low voltage. You may hear that term. So what does that mean? So when we look at a normal EKG that's looking at the electrical circuit of the heart, these spikes are referred to as the QRS. And we look at these, the amplitude of these spikes, how tall they are. And if they are very short and the amplitude is much smaller, we refer to that as low voltage. And that can be seen in an amyloid, but it's not that specific. So only about 15% of patients with AL amyloid have low voltage on their EKG. And then, of course, the echo, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, specifically strain imaging and what that means. And then also on cardiac MRI, we can have different things such as delayed gadolinium enhancement that indicate possible cardiac involvement. So moving forward to specifically talk about what we look at the on the ultrasound or the echo of your heart. You'll get these reports, your cardiologist will go over the results, but what does it all mean? So we're looking at the wall thickness because we know in cardiac amyloid, your heart walls are gonna get thicker and stiffer than they should be. So we look at wall thickness and stiffness, pumping function, valve function, and pressure in your lungs. So the first thing is that on a report, you often get an ejection fraction. So what is an ejection fraction? What does that mean? Well, ejection fraction is essentially an estimate of the pumping function of your heart. I want to go over what that looks like in a normal heart, in a very weak heart, and then in a heart with amyloid. Because we actually, in the amyloid world, don't care too much about the ejection fraction as I would in my heart failure patients with a different type of heart failure. So the ejection fraction is looking at essentially the pumping function of the heart. So you can see this left ventricle as the main pumping chamber of the heart pumps out the blood. So we look at the volume at the start of the cardiac cycle in that left ventricle, and then we look at the amount of blood that's ejected during each cardiac cycle. And then that, per that percentage, that ratio of volume ejected to volume at the start is actually referred to as the ejection fraction. So this is going to be uh, a percentage. So in, and here it's depicting the number of blood cells. So we're looking at volume ejected, which was six blood cells, and volume at the start, which was 10. And then that's a uh, ejection fraction of 60%. Normal is anywhere from 50 to 65. And so that's a normal ejection fraction in a normal heart. And then when we think about a weak heart, so this is a weak heart, the pumping function of the heart is not doing well. We think about this volume of blood that's at the start. And then we think about the amount of blood that's ejected. And that amount of blood that's ejected in this heart is actually the exact same as the amount ejected in the, in the prior heart. And when we look at this, this is going to be referred to as a reduced ejection fraction because this ejection fraction is only 30%. Now let's take a look at an amyloid heart. So again, you can see very thick increased walls and there's a smaller amount of blood in this left ventricle at the start of the cardiac cycle. So you can see only representing six red blood cells. And there's also a much smaller amount of blood that's being circulated out through the heart. And so this is a volume ejected was only three. So the actual ejection fraction remains preserved. So 50% ejection fraction, but the amount of blood that a heart with amyloid is ejecting is much smaller. So we often refer to patients with amyloid as having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because we know that the heart isn't functioning as well as it should, but the ejection fraction number is relatively okay. That's why we really, as cardiac amyloidologists, we think 
we worry less about the ejection fraction and more about something that's called the stroke volume index. And that's the amount of blood that your heart pumps out with each cardiac cycle index to your body weight and height. And that gives us a lot more information than just the ejection fraction. And when we think about how the heart functions in general, we think about something called cardiac output. And that is really looking at the amount of blood that your body circulates with each heartbeat, that stroke volume index, times your heart rate. And that's why I mentioned that sometimes patients with amyloid do a little bit better with a slightly higher heart rate and why we want to avoid decreasing your heart rate significantly with medications like beta blockers. Sometimes we need to use beta blockers to control the heart rate and atrial fibrillation, but we want to avoid getting the heart rate too low. So this is just a comparison of the different types of the normal heart, a heart failure with a reduced pumping function, and an amyloid heart to show you the difference in the ejection fraction. So again, it's just a percentage. The absolute amount of, blo of blood that your body is pumping with each heartbeat is way more important than that, it, that exact percentage. And then also, even if your stroke volume index or the amount of blood your heart is pumping out with each beat may be normal at rest, in a setting of amyloid, you may not be able to keep up with exercise. So I wanted to show this depiction as I sort of start to begin to explain strain. So the cardiac function is way more complex than just a squeeze and pump out. So the heart muscle itself sort of twists and it's almost as if you're wringing a wet dish rag. And so the way that the heart muscle works is it's, it's moving circumferentially and longitudinally. So in the setting of someone who has cardiac amyloid with that preserved ejection fraction, how else can we tell how the heart is moving if that ejection fraction is relatively normal. Well, that's when we use something called strain imaging. And you may have seen that on your echo report or your cardiologist may have told you that they're recommending an echo with strain imaging. So strain imaging really allows us to look at the pumping of the heart in a little bit more detail. So with each heart muscle, we know that the heart muscle is in the relaxed state. And then when it contracts, it shortens. So strain essentially looks at the shortening of the muscle fibers. And that gives us a much better idea in amyloid of how well the heart is actually working. And this is what we tend to look at. It's called a bullseye. And the strain, we look at strain at each segment of the heart. And the more negative, the better, because that means that it's shortening well. And we use a depiction, a color scheme. So the more negative, the more normal the strain is. That's when we have that dark, deep red. So this is a strain pattern of a normal heart. And it's looking at it at a cross-sectional view of the heart. So this outer circle is the base of the heart. The mid is the mid ventricle. And then the apex or the tip, very tip of the heart. This is a normal heart. This is a heart with amyloid. So what are the differences? And so with this, you're seeing the base of the heart is very abnormal because those amyloid fibrils will preferentially deposit at the base of the heart and at the mid ventricle. And then they actually tend to spare the apex. And so when we look at the strain pattern, we see normal strain values. The, the shortening of the muscle fibers is working normally at the tip of the heart, but not so much at the base of the heart and the mid ventricle. And that's where we get this abnormal pattern that we call apical sparing and also cherry on top appearance. And so this is, um, although not 100% specific for cardiac amyloid, in the setting of someone who has systemic AL amyloid, it's very helpful for us to see an echo with this pattern that indicates cardiac involvement. And we also follow this strain pattern as you continue on your chemotherapy to see if there's any organ response. So what about thick walls? We talk a lot about the increased wall thickness, and I just want to show you a few things that, as I look at your echoes, what I'm looking for. So this is an image of a heart with amyloid, and so here you can see all four chambers, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle. And then here, the main thing is this increased wall thickness throughout the left ventricle, this interventricular septum, which is the wall in between the two bottom chambers of the heart, and the right ventricle. So very thick wall is suggestive of cardiac amyloid. 
So one thing to mention though, is that it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that if you have thick walls that you're doing poorly, it's really the whole picture. We take all of our testing, the lab work, how you're feeling, the physical exam and the echo into consideration. Here's a patient with AL amyloid and cardiac involvement. You see that there are walls of their heart, this interventricular septum in between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and this posterior wall, that the walls aren't that thick, yet this is a patient with significant heart failure from their cardiac involvement. Here we have someone with a different type of amyloid, transthyretin amyloid, and they have very, very thick walls, as you can see the difference. This is their posterior wall or the wall at the back of the heart, and this is the interventricular septum, which is, again, that wall that goes in between the two bottom chambers. Incredibly thick, yet this patient was relatively asymptomatic. So when we measure wall thickness, how exact and how accurate it is? Well, there can be a lot of variability. So here you see we're measuring that interventricular septum and that posterior wall, and we're getting 17 and 17. Now, anything greater than 12 millimeters is considered to be a thick walled heart. This is the same patient. So measured at a slightly different time during the day at a slightly different area, and we actually get the septum measured at 12 millimeters and at 11 millimeters. So measurements on the exact same day. I really include this just to highlight the fact that there can be discrepancy depending on the sonographer and the reading echocardiologist. So it's really important for your cardiologist who's been following you to be able to look at the images themselves and compare. I frequently remeasure the heart muscle um, on my own to look at the comparison instead of just looking at the report because there can be a, quite a bit of variance. And again, this really highlights that where we're measuring can also change. So if we measure closer to the base of the heart versus the mid ventricle, you can get a difference. And so it's very important just to make sure that you're uniformly following the same area, measuring the same area of the wall. So just to briefly mention that you may have had a cardiac MRI, which is looking for other features to indicate that there's amyloid involvement in the heart. And so this is really an adjunct to echocardiography. And then also heart biopsy may have been needed to help make your diagnosis to look with those, for those amyloid deposits in the heart muscle. So treatment, well, how do we treat the heart involvement? So most of this, I defer to my hematology colleagues, and they continue to be sort of the quarterback and the captain of your treatment. The most important thing is that we stop the source of amyloid and stopping those light chains. And over time, as we've already kind of learned from the earlier talks, that the body can start to have an organ improvement and organ response. And can there, is there a medication to take the amyloid out of the heart? Well, there's been a lot of studies looking at doxycycline, which is an antibiotic that has some anti-amyloidogenic properties and has been thought to disrupt to amyloid fibrils. There have been animal mouse studies that had looked at that and were pretty promising. And initial studies actually did show that there was improvement in organ response in patients that were on doxycycline. But recently, a randomized control trial of patients who were on Cyber-D therapy, interestingly, not daratubumab, just Cyber-D, who were randomized to Cyber-D plus doxycycline versus Cyber-D alone, they really had no change in their progression of, organ, of, uh, progression of disease free survival. So it's still unclear how much of a benefit that doxycycline gives. However, if my patients have been on doxycycline, then I continue it, particularly if they're not having any side effects. Now, I'm in Florida, so one of the major side effects is photosensitivity, so that's the main reason why I've had to stop doxycycline for some of my patients. They can also get GI toxicity as well. And there's other ongoing studies that are currently happening looking at uh, antibodies that are attacking those TTR fibrils and clearing them out. So in my realm, the main thing that I do in terms of offering treatment is to help control the heart failure symptoms. And this is largely with diuretics and water pills. So this is helping to remove fluid from you, remove fluid from the lungs and remove fluid from the lower extremities and occasionally the abdomen. And I tend to like specific types of diuretics. Torsamide and Bumex are my favorite because they have better bioavailability. What does that mean? It means that you can absorb them better. Lasix is 
often the first go-to diuretic, and it's a great diuretic, but sometimes people with amyloid have a lot of gut edema, so they don't respond as well to the Lasix, and we move on to the torsamide or Bumex that are absorbed much better. Now, other medications that are often used in heart failure with different types of heart failure, like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, those are used to help make the heart muscle stronger. However, these don't typically help people with amyloid um, because the problem is not often a problem with a weaker heart. It's a thicker, stiffer heart. So these medications actually can cause sometimes side effects, but it's always on an individual basis of whether or not the medications are needed. So heart transplant. So I want to briefly mention heart transplant and just talk about a few things. So heart transplant originally was contraindicated in the setting of AL amyloid, but that's really based on data from the 1980s and 1990s. And we obviously have had a lot of advancements in chemotherapy. Initially, there was concern because the one-year survival outcomes in patients who were transplanted for cardiac amyloid in the setting of AL amyloid had worse one-year outcomes compared to patients who were transplanted for other reasons. This was though, again, mostly because of the chemotherapy that was at that time, and there was a higher risk of recurrence of amyloid deposits in the allograft. Now we actually know from more recent data that with all of our advancements in chemotherapy, that patients do better, but often if someone doesn't have a true organ response from a heart standpoint, then we have to think about cardiac transplantation in a select patient population. And we do know that there's only a few centers that actually do heart transplantation for AL amyloid, but we know that the outcomes are actually pretty good. Survival, as you can see here from this Kaplan-Meier curve, is similar to the other curves that have been shown. Outcome and one-year survival rates after heart transplantation for patients with amyloid versus those who were transplanted for non-amyloid reasons are actually pretty similar. And also between the different types of amyloid, AL and ATTR, the results are pretty similar. So sometimes we do have to consider this advanced therapy of heart transplant in patients who have, have achieved a really good hematologic response, but unfortunately are then suffering from their extensive cardiac involvement. This involves a multidisciplinary team and our large, animal, our large transplant group as well, because we have to make sure that that patient is the a right candidate, that they don't have any autonomic dysfunction or significant other in, organ involvement. So we do think about cardiac transplantation in patients who have achieved a good hematologic response, but still have a lot of cardiomyopathy or heart failure related to the amyloid fibrils in their heart in select patient population. So not everyone is a candidate for a variety of reasons. So just to answer a few questions, how do I know if my heart is getting better? Of course, that's one of the main things that people wanna know. Unfortunately, there's not a single test to be able to tell us. So we do use imaging. We use blood tests. So we use the troponin and the NT pro BMP and also renal function. And we think about the NT pro BMP again as a trend. We look to see is it trending towards improvement or is it worsening? And then we do use imaging techniques, but the important thing to point out is frequent echo and frequent cardiac MRIs after you've started on your chemotherapy isn't particularly useful from me from a cardiac standpoint, because I'm not gonna see major changes. Now on the echo, we do tend to get echoes every six months to every year. And we look at the wall thickness and we look at that strain imaging. And it can give us an idea if there's been an, a specific organ response. The biggest thing though, is how you feel. Are you able to walk and do all of your activities that we want to do? Have you been hospitalized recently for a heart failure exacerbation? That's a poor prognostic feature. Are you requiring more and more and more diuretics? That's also a poor prognostic feature and really a surrogate for disease progression. Those are the questions that I'm more interested in when I'm seeing you in follow-up as opposed to what does your echo show exactly and what does your blood work show exactly?
And then what can I do to help my heart? So always patients want to know what they can do. And it's a great question. And so the most important thing to emphasize is make sure that you have the right diagnosis. You're all here with us today, probably because you have a diagnosis of AL. So your doctors have been on the right track. But I just want to make sure that we always continue to focus on increased awareness. So the, what the amyloidosis support group is doing is so important because a lot of times, unfortunately, patients come to me very late and they often come to me because their cardiologist noticed something abnormal on their echo or their MRI. So they come to me first without getting hematologic testing. And it may be that they had an MRI that was abnormal four months ago, and then they get sent to me because their cardiac MRI was abnormal. And the first thing, of course, that I would do is hematologic testing, and they have significant abnormalities, and they go on to have a diagnosis of AL. So I always teach my residents and my fellows that if there's a suspicion for amyloid based on imaging or signs and symptoms of heart failure, then it's very important to try to give yourself at least a week to make the diagnosis because AL is, of course, a medical emergency that we want to start treatment right away. From a heart failure perspective, making sure to weigh yourself every day, that can help to give me an idea if you're accumulating with fluid. Two to three pounds in one night and five pounds in one week is going to be more fluid weight as, as opposed to caloric intake. Compression stockings is my absolute favorite thing to recommend. Patients with amyloid tend to have lower blood pressures because of autonomic dysfunction, involvement in the heart. It makes it really difficult for me to be able to use diuretics. So I encourage the use of compression stockings, not only to mobilize fluid, but also to help with blood pressure. Limit your salt and fluid intake, particularly to try to help prevent over accumulation of fluid. But also the two last important things to mention is that we still want you to continue exercising. You know, we want you to go at your own pace, but it's very important to stay active so that you don't also get very deconditioned as you're moving through treatments. And then even some light strength training, cardiac cachexia and muscle wasting is very common in AL amyloid. So doing what you can to avoid that is helpful. And so with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. That was, you answered actually quite a few questions in your presentation. It was really super. I'm looking at some questions I can just throw on the floor now. That, okay, we're going to go a little out of order. We're going to, we're going to delay our Q&A for Dr. Learn and Dr. Lyle and all of our other amyloidologists for a bit because um, I don't want to get Spencer Guthrie in, tr in trouble and have some spousal abuse in his house or anything. So um, we're going to skip to um, go ahead a little bit and we're going to hear from Atralis a and Alexion and Prathina and then we will have a giant Q&A with everyone, okay? So um, we, earlier we were talking about all of the... Um, treatments that go after the plasma cells that, that go rogue and, 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 and cause the amyloid light chains to, you know, to wreak havoc. But now we're, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the drugs that are in research and clinical trials right now to, I say, vacuum out the amyloid from the organs, from the heart, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, or whatever. So um, the, the, the first person we're going to hear from is Spencer Guthrie. And a trellis, and you might know of this treatment um, of what they're doing more from uh, previously. We would hear from Dr. Jonathan Wall, and Spencer works with Dr. Wall at the University of Tennessee. So, Spencer, take it away. Thank you, Mario, and thank you uh, to the patients for allowing me to speak. It's always a pleasure to be able to do this. Uh, I do apologize. I have uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, an event for my kid that my wife is going to be really mad if I don't attend. So, uh, um, and you can follow up with any questions to Muriel and she'll send them over to me. So our mission is to improve the lives of patients by developing both diagnostics and transformational therapeutics to remove toxic amyloid. Uh, this is what we're uh, wholly dedicated to. So we're, our company's uh, completely focused on systemic amyloidosis. I think you've heard earlier and you guys uh, probably know this very well, but um, cardiac amyloidosis or amyloidosis in general can come from many pre precursor proteins. Uh, the two most common are TTR and AL. Uh, and we're really focused not on the precursor proteins, but after the amyloid fibrils are in the organs. So our goal is to, to remove those fibrils. We have uh, three therapeutics in development and a diagnostic uh, 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, individually uh, in a moment. So the diagnostic agent is called ATO1. It has one of those uh, also crazy generic names like other drugs, iodine and Um, So it's hard to say three times in a row. Um, and this imaging agent, this is the one that uh, Mira refers to. This was the original studies were done by Jonathan Wall at University of Tennessee. Uh, Atralis works with Jonathan Wall and licenses this product for formal development to with the goal of getting this to patients as a commercial diagnostic. Uh, we, you know, we see a lot of advantages with this. One of them is that it's what we call panamyloid, meaning that the, the peptide, which is the basis of the imaging agent, binds to all types of amyloid. So we bind to commonalities on the fibrils themselves. Um, we have shown, and I'll show you a few slides on that, the ability to detect amyloid in multiple organs and really quantify how much there is. So, you know, we see this as a comprehensive way to see where the amyloid is and how much is in your body. We're also, as I mentioned, developing therapeutics, and we see this imaging agent uh, is very important for that because we can really uh, look at specific organs that are impacted and use this as a way to measure any change uh, that we might see in amyloid. And certainly uh, uh, improving, the most important is improving diagnosis. So to be able to facilitate diagnos diagnosis earlier and to improve the diagnostic accuracy. So a phase one, two study was completed at, at UT. Uh, there were 50 amyloid patients that were part of that. 25 of those were uh, in AL. And 24 out of the 25 patients had a positive uh, uptake in the organs. So we were able to visualize uh, where the amyloid is. Um, and we, we really saw it throughout the body. Uh, obviously not in everyone, but each patient is very, very unique. Uh, but we saw uh, amyloid to heart, kidney, liver, spleen, lungs, pancreas, and some localized uh, amyloid. Uh, we also evaluated healthy volunteers as part of that, and we didn't see any uh, any cardiac uptake um, in those in those patients. Uh, the adverse events from the study were mild and transient. And just just a couple of uh, examples of the images. Uh, it was really to show really how heterogeneous um, amyloid is. I there's a great quote that you know, more Gertz had uh, one time and probably everyone feels this way is once you, you see one amyloid patient, you've seen one amyloid patient. Um, these are some examples. So this is uh, uptake where we can see the amyloid in the kidney and the spleen. Um, in this patient, you can see really a lot of amyloid in the liver, pancreas and the heart. Uh, this, this image shows um, amyloid uptake in the lung uh, and another uh, closer image of, uh, of kidneys and pancreas. This is an example of localized amyloid, so amyloid that's in the uh, lymph nodes. We also see some amyloid uh, on occasion, more in TTR patients where we see amyloid in the joints, uh, mainly where carpal tunnel or, sh or shoulder um, involvement in these patients. Uh, this is a kind of a nice, unique example, and the reason that we like to show this one is this patient had a kidney transplant, and um, you can see in this middle row here, these are their, the patient's uh, original kidneys, and you can see a lot of uptake in those kidneys, and this patient had a kidney transplant a few years ago, and with the new transplanted kidney, we saw uh, absolutely no uptake in that, and so that's something that obviously the, the patient was happy to see. Uh, but it really provides a nice control to show a kidney without amyloid versus one with amyloid in the same patient. So ongoing upcoming trials. So we have a study ongoing uh, called a, it's, we're calling a test retest study. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, we have an ongoing initiated, investigator initiated trial at uh, BWH Har Harvard with uh, Dr. Dabala. Uh, we are in planning now uh, to start a phase three uh, multi-center trial to uh, register this agent, and that will be in both AL and ATTR patients. And there are other uh, uh, investigator-initiated trials being planned. So this test retest study is really to see uh, how, if there's variability between two imaging tests. And why that's important is if we want to use this to see a change in amyloid over time, we need to ensure that uh, two tests that are done closely together have the same result. Um, and for AL, this is currently enrolling patients who are in uh, hematologic remission 
who have a kidney, liver, or cardiac involvement. Uh, this study is being conducted in Northern California, and um, it's, it's being managed by a company called Adaptive Research. Um, if you are interested, uh, you can contact this number or this email to find out more information about the study. This does, we do provide travel costs uh, and there are uh, availability for at-home blood draws for the study. It's two visits, so one at the baseline, which is the initial scan, and one uh, that's done uh, six weeks later. On the therapeutic side, we have um, our, our most advanced therapeutic is one called ATO3, which is using SAP, which you've probably all heard of, uh, as they do SAP scanning in the UK, where they use SAP radio label to, um, to look at uh, amyloid in patients' bodies. And we've combined that with what's called an FC, which is um, one part of an antibody, but this is the part of the antibody that stimulates the immune system to bring in um, macrophages to uh, hopefully opsonize or eat the amyloid. And we have uh, a second therapeutic that is pretty closely behind. And I think the interesting thing about this, these are both called fusion proteins. So these are not typical antibodies. These are things where we combine two components, uh, one that binds to the amyloid and one that stimulates the immune system to uh, potentially remove amyloid. Um, I think just to say a point about this is an antibody with a peptide tied to it. This peptide is very similar using the same technology as the peptide with the imaging agent. So we know with the imaging agent, this peptide binds to amyloid and you know the, the hope here is, uh, and we can certainly see it in, in preclinical animal studies, but that this peptide is gonna bind to amyloid in humans, bring in the um, monoclonal antibody, which will uh, effectuate um, the immune system removal of amyloid. On the clinical therapeutic side, we do have one ongoing trial. So this is a, uh, a trial that's looking at what we call target engagement. So we show, uh, we, uh, the, the goal of the study is to show that the agent is binding to the amyloid. Um, it is a very low dose study. So it's not one where we would expect any therapeutic um, efficacy. This is one where, you know, we're really looking at the binding part of that. And this study is being conducted at uh, the University of Tennessee. Uh, this study is relatively close to recruitment. So if you're, you know, if, if you're interested, um, you know, it, it's probably something that you need to contact University of Tennessee sooner than later. And this study was enrolling ATTR, AL, and other patients. Um, we've closed this um, to other types of patients now. So we're actively seeking AL amyloid patients with active renal involvement. And then for the second therapeutic I talked about, we are uh, opening clinical trials uh, for that agent in AL amyloidosis uh, in the first half of 2023. And sorry for the quick run through. Um, hopefully that was helpful for you guys. And again, uh, I apologize for not being at the panel. Uh, but please forward any questions to Muriel and I'll, I'll work through her to get back to you. Thank you, Spencer. And I do have three questions specifically for you and I will forward them to you so that we can get them answered. So I do want all of our attendees to know we will get your questions answered. If we don't get them answered today, it'll be in the next couple of days, but we will get them answered. Thank you so much, Spencer. Thank you, Muriel. Okay. And next on our agenda, we have uh, from Alexion. Julia Catini. Hi, Hi, Julia. It's the first time we've met, I believe. Yes, nice to meet you, Muriel. Thanks for inviting us. I guess I'll share my screen. Right. People know of, of, of Lexion more in relation to the Calum drug. And that's what we're here with. So, yeah. So, thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for the invitation. And yes, this was um, a compound that was formerly being developed by Calum Biosciences. As Muriel said, my name is Julia Catini. I'm the senior medical director working with Alexion, which is also now part of AstraZeneca, and I'm within the medical affairs group. So as clinicians um, are developing new drugs, uh, they're really looking to target the amyloid and knowing that the mechanism for AL amyloidosis, current therapy really targets the production of the amyloid today. And once a patient's diagnosed, treatments is usually initiated in virtually all patients that have some type of systemic disease. 
Today, the treatment is largely based on chemotherapy and or autologous stem cell transplant. That really depends on the patient eligibility and the clinician decision. So today, new strategies are actually being developed, and this is where Cal 101 comes in. And we're looking to target the amyloid that's already deposited in the organs and tissues, which we heard a little bit of, about earlier in the uh, presentations. Cal 101 is being studied to see whether it can remove the amyloid deposits from the tissues and organs in patients with AL amyloidosis. It is a monoclonal antibody. It's designed from an earlier monoclonal antibody that within um, preclinical studies was able to interact with light chains and decrease tumor size. So let's take a look at some of the clinical development programs that are ongoing right now with Cal. So we are assessing Cal 101 in a phase two study as shown here to evaluate the safety and tolerability in combination with Cyborg D. And as we know, the advancement of daratutumab in AL amyloidosis, we did uh, add a part B to the study to assess the combination um, with Cyborg D plus daratutumab. This study is not currently recruiting but we have included patients with Mayo stages one, two, and three A, AL amyloidosis, and this is based on the European modification of Mayo staging. Um, it did exclude patients with other types of amyloidosis and patients with multiple myeloma. We are continuing to treat patients today, and we have had recent analyses of data that has been presented, most recently at the American Society of Hematology in December of 2021 and the American College of Cardiology this past April. These analyses have reported that Cal 101 to date is generally well tolerated um, in combination with Cyborg D plus or minus DARA. And now in some patients um, that are off their Cyborg D, um, some of the most common adverse events that have been noted to date are nausea, constipation, diarrhea, fatigue, and rash. And we've also seen that in some patients that have had cardiac amyloid involvement at baseline, cardiac responses have also been observed. So that brings us to the CARES program. So this is our two parallel phase three trials that have been initiated with the primary purpose to determine whether Cal 101 removes AL amyloid deposits from the organs and tissues and to see if it can improve survival in patients with Mayo stage 3A and 3B, again, based on the European modification of Mayo staging. So the two most severe patients. These trials are termed CARES, um, which stands for Cardiac Amyloid Reaching for Extended Survival. All patients enrolling are newly diagnosed, they're treatment naive, and they have a planned start of Cyborg D-based treatment regimen. This is a placebo-controlled trial um, that is randomizing patients to Cal 101 or placebo, and this is in addition to their Cyborg D-based regimen. The trial is continuing today, and it will go on until a planned number of events um, are reached. In addition to survival, we'll also be looking at the safety and tolerability, as well as assessing what the impact is on the quality of life for these patients. We are currently recruiting in centers across the United States and countries around the globe. Um, as of right now, we're in 16 different countries with some more to follow. Um, so please, if you have any questions, let us know and, and we'd be happy to answer anything for you. Thanks, Muriel. Thank you so much. We have some questions for you, but what I would like to have is all of our physicians, our amyloidologists, our pharma people that and everyone we have left to, to put their screen on and, 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 and we have some questions to address. And, and I want everyone to know, we will try and address as many as we can. And if this, we don't get to yours, because we are running late, nothing new here, right? We will send these questions to our physicians and our pharma people for answers and we will get the answers to you in the next two days. So don't think we forgot about you, okay? So Bob, make sure you have everyone on the screen, okay? And here's a question for our Caleb and our, our, our well, elect, it would be Alexion and, and, and our Prathena people. And, and that is a concern, okay, because these drugs are in clinical trials for newly diagnosed patients right now. And if it gets approved, if assuming they get approved by the FDA, let's assume that they both do get approved by the FDA, will they only be approved for newly diagnosed patients? And what, what about the patients that, um, that have already, you know, that are not newly diagnosed or maybe that were on this drug before, like the Prathena trial for NEOD and they had to stop, what will happen to them? So do you have a response to that, Anscar? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe I'll start and, and Julia can uh, chime in as well. 
Uh, so, so you're right. Right now, the uh, vital study uh, had enrolled patients, newly diagnosed patients, and in the firm, we're also planning to enroll, and we, we are currently enrolling newly diagnosed patients. So that's kind of where we're starting. We had previously had a phase two study that looked at previously diagnosed patients, um, and in those those results did not come back uh, positive. And so we're still kind of sifting through those results and figuring out what we would do as a next step. We would expect that likely uh, a drug like this would be approved first for newly diagnosed patients, but then of course, we would go back to the drawing board and figure out what we would do in terms of uh, next studies and trials uh, to also address that question and to provide additional treatment options. Julie, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, yeah, so you know, we also have phase one and phase two trials that were done and not all of the patients were newly diagnosed. We do have that data, but those studies were not designed to look at the efficacy. Um, so again, like Prothena, we would take a look at that data and then see if there's other studies that we could develop for an expanded indication. Okay, so no trials on the horizon right now for previously diagnosed patients for both. No. No. Okay, and what were the what are any the side effects, if any, from your drug, Julia? Yeah, so right now we're not seeing anything above and beyond what we see for Cyborg D um, and Daratudumab. The side effects that we've seen in the long-term extension in our phase two trial, the most common have been nausea, constipation, diarrhea, and rash. Um, we see other adverse events as well, and I'd happy to be, you know, send more information on that, but nothing out of the ordinary that we've seen in patients with AL amyloidosis. Okay, and Ainsgar, um, what about you? Any side effects that people would want to hear about? Yeah, I, I had um, uh, uh, shown some of that on, on this slide. So the most common side effects that we have seen were a fatigue, nausea, a peripheral edema, uh, constipation, and diarrhea. And so far, what we've seen in the vital studies is that the, uh, the AEs that were reported were similar uh, between the uh, treatment group and the placebo group. Okay, and, and one last question for both of you. Um, and that is, it's, and we have this from at, emailed in from two different people actually. And that is when they were first diagnosed, they were not at centers where they had your trial. They wonder even though they've had one or in one case, two treatments, is it too late for them to get to a center and get on your trial or do you not allow for that? Yeah, I, I think some of those um, uh, questions have to be addressed, you know, with, with the specific physicians. There, there are certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, and again, I, I would refer also to the affirmal.com study where there's context where that can be discussed in more detail. You know, as I had mentioned, so right now we are looking for those newly diagnosed patients, but we realize that there is kind of that tight window between kind of diagnosis uh, and then starting of treatment. And, and I think one would have to look at that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And Julia? Yeah, we are also looking at those. We do have some flexibility within the protocol to allow one to two cycles, but again, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, as it is essential to get those patients started, we have to see exactly when they started and if we could enroll them. So, and I can send the information uh, for our trial as well over to you, Mar Muriel. Okay, so let's go to our, our hematologists, okay, um, and, and Dr. Learn, who also work, he, he does double duty as a hematologist and a nephrologist. Do you have any patients that uh, were at other centers and had one or two treatments prior to going on the uh, Kalem trial or the Bertemad trial? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, all of the ones that I've started are um, newly diagnosed, so they haven't been treated. And, and our um, uh, our Protina trial just, um, just started at, um, Mayo about a, got approved a week ago. So we're, I know that we're starting to, uh, enroll, um, the, uh, KL 101 trial has been started much earlier. So we've been enrolling more patients in that, but, but no, I have not, um, I have not had any patient that started therapy elsewhere and then got on the trial. What about you, Dr. Tuckman? Uh, we have one person who uh, wasn't, had started uh, chemotherapy for newly diagnosed AL and uh, is actually trying to go on the kale study now. So we'll see. But I'd say that's a pretty unusual circumstance only because they really typically come to us at least most often before they've started chemotherapy or they're a couple months into it already. 
So catching somebody in that spot where they really just started plasma cell directed chemotherapy, uh, but they're not far enough in to um, be disqualified from the KLM study is pretty unusual. Dr. Zonder. Hi. Um, yeah, the patients that we've enrolled so far on the uh, Cal study uh, uh, were ones that we saw. Um, the flexibility uh, that was discussed was sort of, I, I, I believe, something, uh, it was a modification of the protocol over time. I think originally there was a demand that the, the treatment uh, start in um, patients who hadn't had prior therapy. Um, but now there is more flexibility. I think we've actually, I think we have a patient that we just saw uh, who um, is going to be starting a little bit of therapy and uh, hopefully will back into um, you know, the, the trial after getting a little bit. And we're in the same um, situation that Nelson's in uh, with regards um, to the uh, Prothena trial. We're just opening it. And so it's been sort of staggered. So we'll see uh, what happens there. Okay, great. D Dr. Learn, uh, this person wants to know about creatinine levels when on home dialysis. His creatinine bounces between, to me, they're really big numbers, nine and 11. And his doctors don't be, seem to be concerned. Are we concerned about creatinine levels when someone is on dialysis? Um, not to the degree that we would if someone was off dialysis. However, if someone, nine to 11 is pretty typical for someone on peritoneal dialysis. We would not see nine to 11 on someone on hemodialysis. Um, and so, for example, if we did see someone with uh, creatinine of nine or 11 on hemodialysis, we would wonder whether or not we're getting effective dialysis. Um, now, if the peritoneal dialysis patient was 15, 16, then we would worry about the same thing. And I talked a little bit about how the membranes uh, could wear out. So periodically we have to do tests to make sure that we are delivering the um, appropriate amount of dialysis uh, for these patients. So, um, so yes, we do pay attention to the creatinine, but it doesn't mean the same as um, it, it does uh, before dialysis. Okay, well, well, I have you there. Someone is questioning um, Bumex for edema. His dosage is 10 milligrams a day and um, his legs get really big. Anyway, is there something more that can be done or is Bumex the thing? I know I, I remember Dr. Lyle mentioned Bumex as one of the diuretics that she likes. Yeah, so, um, you know, as Dr. Lyle says, uh, there are, so um, all these diuretics belong to the same class of drug. They're called loop diuretics. Um, and while we think that they are, they work pretty much the same, they do have their individual characteristics. And, and certainly um, uh, if one isn't working well enough, uh, um, you could certainly try another loop diuretic. Um, so uh, you can switch to uh, torsamide or Lasix. But one of the other things that um, uh, a lot of times uh, patients have is low blood pressure. So if they have really low blood pressure, um, they may not respond well to the diuretic. Um, and the other thing too is that, uh, um, are they getting the appropriate doses Although um, 10 milligrams of Bumex is, is quite a bit, but how is he taking it? Is that one all at once? Uh, is it split up into doses? And then sometimes we can also add Xeroxalan as a booster. Um, so patients who may not have adequate uh, response or the response is short to the loop diuretic, we can also add Xeroxalan. Um, I spell that. Zeroxalin is spelled Z-A-R-O-X-O-L-Y-N. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and one more question for you before we go to onto others. I've got lots of questions for everybody, but we, we're trying to spread it out here. Um, I have two, G, two grams of protein in my urine and a creatinine of 1.4, 1.5. 
other than trying to maintain a low sodium diet, is there anything I can do to preserve or improve my kidney function? My potassium was 5.2, so I was recently started on Localma. Um, so yeah, there, um, there isn't really anything from a standard therapy standpoint that could um, improve the kidney function other than getting the amyloid treated. Now, we're assuming this patient has AL? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, low salt diet is um, um, definitely what we recommend. Um, and, uh, um, and just treatment now, that's why these studies are being done with, um, with uh, Prothena and um, Kale, Kalem um, is we're looking for different drugs that might um, help the kidney heal in addition to the chemotherapy. So, so as nephrologists, we are looking at the trial results very, very closely, even though that uh, they are only um, enrolling cardiac patients. Uh, um, some of those will have kidney disease as well. And we're going to be looking to see if there's kidney signals with these drugs. Okay, and uh, thank you. Dr. Lyle, uh, do you recommend patients with high cholesterol due to kidney involvement take Repasa or a statin? If my protein is slowly decreasing over time, is there a danger in not taking anything? I have mild heart involvement. My cholesterol is 337 milligrams. Yeah, so that's a great question. We typically, you know, as I've mentioned before, always take this with a multidisciplinary approach, but especially looking at any sort of other heart risk factors, I would recommend the addition of a statin. I typically follow our our cholesterol guidelines that we have from the American College of Cardiology, starting with a statin first, and then in certain patients, you know, following up on their cholesterol if they have any need for anything additional. Okay, here's another one for you. My cardiologist says he knows my heart is thick because I have AL amyloidosis. Well, okay. Uh, whereas in a normal patient, the thickening is an indication of a possible heart failure. I, okay, that's this is from someone 86 years old. They have a question about the NT probing P and the other uh, biomarkers. How are they used in any evaluation? Well, I think your presentation did a really good job of explaining that. Um, so her, her oncologist and cardiologist are researching how to use the results of these tests. Do you think that maybe this person should get a second opinion from a center where the cardiologist doesn't have to research how to use these tests? <laughs> Uh, p potentially. Um, and I think one thing to, to mention is like with the wall thickness, and that's why I kind of wanted to emphasize that it's very variable depending on the, the sonographer and also the echocardiologist that's reading it. We can get different um, values for their wall thickness. We see wall thickness in other entities like uncontrolled hypertension. And that's why the strain imaging is so helpful for a, kind of evaluating for cardiac amyloid. And then the NT pro BMP and Component are also very helpful because if someone has, especially someone with normal renal function, if they have increased wall thickness, abnormal strain, and an elevated troponin and NT pro BNP, that's all going to tell me that most likely they have cardiac involvement. Okay, thank you. Um, to all of our physicians, dexamethasone is causing this person's side effects for a couple of days, upset stomach being the worst, despite three antacids. Can it be lowered or stopped? And we get this question a lot about dexamethasone. Can it be lowered or stopped? So let's start with Dr. Zonder and then we'll move through. Yeah, so um, absolutely. I mean, um, it's very standard practice to modify the dexamethasone dose right out of the gate in older patients, patients with known cardiac involvement, patients with edema, um, because it can aggravate uh, congestive heart failure and fluid retention. Uh, and even when you do that, I mean, so that right there, probably three quarters of amyloidosis patients, you know, need need to start at a low dose. And even using that approach, at least 50% of patients will require further dosage reductions uh, as they go through therapy. Okay, Dr. Tuckman. I agree with all that. I mean, it's like managing any other side effect from chemotherapy. We always have to benefit or we always have to weigh 
what's the benefit of continuing at the full dose versus the toxicity of it? And if it's a little bit of toxicity, then we try to live with it. If it's too much, then we back off. Um, and as Dr. Zondra is saying, uh, with dexamethasone, we frequently have to reduce it. And the other thing that I would point out is that there's nothing magic about that usual 40 milligrams of weekly dexamethasone. That's just sort of the way we've always done it. And no one's looked at 40 versus 20. And in terms of steroid potency, 20 milligrams is still a pretty whopping dose. Um, and so I often say that I'm not even sure that 40 milligrams is the magic dose, since I have a very low threshold to reduce to 20 or even further in patients that are really having trouble. But again, for patients that are doing well, we do the typical 40. Dr. Learn? Yeah, I agree with uh, everything Dr. Zonder um, and Dr. Tuckman said. Uh, you know, I always tell my patients that we know you need some, but, um, you know, how much has really not been determined. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, on the Daracyp or D, really, the dexamethasone um, for the first six cycles is, is part of the cyborg D. Um, but after the uh, six cycle, it's really um, there to prevent uh, any side effects of uh, daratumumab. And we actually have been starting to reduce that significantly um, in our patients. And in some patients uh, who um, are actually not having any side effects, sometimes we eliminate it altogether. But by then, you know, the dexamethasone dose should be down to about eight milligrams per um, dose of the daratumumab anyway. Okay. Now, he, this is a question in regards to what is considered a complete hematological response. Uh, and so if we could just kind of go through the, the short version of what it is, because this person is questioning, uh, what percentage of bone marrow involvement is considered to be a full response? So is bone marrow, well, let's, what is complete hematological response and is bone marrow percentage involved in that? We'll start with you, Dr. Sonder. Um, I mean, you know, honestly, hematologic response is really based on the measurement of uh, light chains, you know, more than plasma cells. Um, so, um, it's, it's only when we start getting into um, ultra deep response rates or response levels, rather, uh, what we call like minimal residual disease, um, uh, negative uh, remissions, you know, where you're, you're actually counting clonal plasma cells in the bone marrow. Uh, and, um, you know, then you're looking for like literally a needle in a haystack. You're looking for like one cell in 100,000 or 500,000 or a million. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm interested to hear what other people say, but I mean, really what we're mostly looking for is disappearance of light chains in serum and urine and uh, disappearance of an M protein. And we, you know, as a secondary, uh, less important, but secondary indicator of what, what the plasma cell clone is doing. And we, we take that as, as our measurement of response. Dr. Tuckman. Um, so I completely agree. Uh, I mean, I'd say that as Dr. Zondra is alluding to, you know, when we think about what's really critical in amyloidosis, it's not killing the cells as much as suppressing the bad protein. The protein is what causes the disease. We need to control the level of the protein. So in some sense, it doesn't really matter what the cells are doing. Now, of course, you can't completely disconnect them because the cells make the protein, but just to emphasize is the protein levels in the blood that are really of paramount importance. Um, beyond that, there is also, you know, the distinction between real life clinical care and clinical studies. So technically a complete response requires a bone marrow biopsy and showing less than 5% plasma cells. Um, that's not necessarily clinically all that helpful. Again, the most important part is showing suppression of those proteins. And so I'd say that for a clinical study, um, a, demonstrating a true complete response, including bone marrow biopsy and the, the full gamut of tests is much more critical. Whereas in routine clinical practice outside of uh, clinical studies, we often talk about serological complete responses where the proteins have normalized, but we haven't technically done the bone marrow biopsy because it's not going to change anything necessarily in a patient who's otherwise doing well. Okay. Dr. Learn, do you have anything to add? No, not really. I mean, I think that uh, um, everything that was said is, is right on the mark. Um, you know, a lot of people try to introduce MRD into amyloid um, based on the MRD data from multiple myeloma, but three studies have been done and you know we're not 
it, it's not uniformly helpful uh, with uh, MRD and amyloid as it is uh, in multiple myeloma. So I think that um, as Dr. Zonder and Dr. Um, Tuckman said, uh, we really are still stressing on the elimination of the protein um, more than the cells, although uh, again, the cells make the protein, but, but beyond what um, we see with less than 5%, um, we don't know if MRD um, to the, you know, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million is any more beneficial, at least um, not right now. More studies are needed to show whether these are definitely um, useful tools in pale amyloidosis. Okay, so we, so we can then say to this person that asked the question and others who may have the question, if you have a bone marrow biopsy after you've after your incomplete hematological response due to your free light chain measurements, and you have a bone marrow biopsy and it shows 4% plasma cells, you're still in complete hematological response, yes? So if the, if the light chains, so the he, complete hematological response by the ISA criteria requires that the, um, there's no monoclonal protein detected on immunofixation and that the um, free light chain ratio is normal. So if those two criteria are met and they have, you know, one to 4% plasma cell, they're in complete hematologic response. Now there's, so there's complete hematologic response, but I think that Dr. Zonder and Dr. Tuckman and, um, and I don't see Dr. Rubin seeing anymore, but um, I think all of us have seen patients that continue to have organ progression, even though, quote unquote, they're in complete hematologic response. And, and what Dr. Muttar has shown is that uh, looking at the DFLC level, uh, so a DFLC level of four is the very good partial response, but what Dr. Mutar did was take that down to DFLC of two and DFLC of one. And when he did that, he did see that there were additional uh, benefits. However, that was a retrospective study. And so we need uh, prospective data to show whether this is actually um, you know, better marker of uh, hematologic response than what we have now. Uh, but if you look, if you ask what is now the standard, it's still just negative immunofixation and um, a normal free light chain ratio. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lyle, is continued organ damage, specifically septal and left ventricular thickening of the heart, possible? through complete hematological response, although, I'm sorry, though complete hematological response has been reached and maintained for years? Yeah, so that's a great question. And just kind of, I think what was alluded to, yes, we do see um, organ progression and not necessarily that we're looking at that increased wall thickness. It's more organ failure, progression of their heart failure. Um, so yes, we can see, I've seen a patient who had complete hematologic remission since 2000, and he had progression of his heart failure, and we ended up doing a transplant. So we, we can see that. And that's why we closely followed these patients from a cardiology standpoint, even if they've achieved complete remission. What if someone had already had a heart transplant and now we're starting to see, even though they're in complete hematological response, we're seeing the, the new heart having some issues with amyloidosis. What would happen then? Yeah, that, that, that's a much tougher question. And, and I guess I would be, like I mentioned, heart transplant was is relatively contraindicated previously in the 1980s, 1990s. So because of that risk of recurrence, um, if that is the case, there's actually, there's a lot of controversy in the heart transplant world in terms of how to follow up these patients who have received a heart transplant for AL amyloid, how to follow them. Are we staining their heart biopsies that we routinely do for rejection also for Congo red staining? 
So if someone has, uh, I guess it would be a little difficult to know if they have recurrence. It would be more in terms of hematologic testing. And then if there was concern from our biopsies that we do, we would look for amyloid deposits. And if so, then we would just restart treatment and work with our hematology colleagues to, again, address the underlying hematologic disorder from that standpoint. Okay, great. Okay, stem cell transplant. Okay. Um, who should and who should not get a stem cell transplant? How is this decision made? And I realize it's going to vary depending on the center, but we'll start with you, Dr. Zonder. Oh, can't you? Can't you? Glad you're going, I'm glad you're going first, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, you know, there are uh, published criteria. Um, uh, uh, several centers have published their their own criteria. Um, Mayo, Mayo, for starters, Boston particularly. Um, it varies a little bit center by center, and you know I think all of us have the experience that sometimes there are uh, exceptions to the rule. Um, uh, but um, in in general, uh, patients who um, you know, don't have sufficient uh, cardiac uh, function, um, which uh, can be measured uh, according to um, echocardiographic uh, parameters or functional status, uh, or patients who have multi-organ involvement uh, are also at higher risk of transplant-related, um, you know, fatal complications. Um, people, uh, many centers have a lot of uh, concern, particularly about patients with uh, amyloid uh, involving the gut because of concerns about excessive melphalan toxicity uh, for those patients. So it's, it's not a one size fits all. Um, uh, and, you know, um, you know I, I would say that in my own practice, I mean, our, our transplant team is quite familiar with the um, with, with sort of published uh, criteria um, and uh, also sort of have their own uh, feelings about, uh, about it. And if I have a patient who, um, you know, uh, is that our transplanters decline, you know, I, my, my, my practice is I, I know which centers around the country and I will not name them on this call, <laughs> but I know which centers are the more aggressive transplant centers. And, you know, and so the, the you know, uh, a second opinion from one of those centers is valuable because if they also agree uh, that this patient is not a uh, transplant candidate, I think that usually settles the question for everybody. That's a great response. And I love the fact that people are always saying, you know, my doctor is going to be upset if I get a second opinion. I don't want to hurt his feelings or hurt her feelings. She'll think, I don't think she's very good if I get a second opinion. And here you are saying you're encouraging a second opinion. And I think it's important for our audience to hear that. I thank you so much. And now Dr. Tuckman will go to you and our stem cell transplant question. Uh, so totally agree with what Dr. Zondra said, and I think that I would sort of take a different approach on the question, which is to say that once somebody is deemed a transplant candidate medically, uh, the question comes up now in 2022 of who we should transplant. And so as I alluded to, in light of the Andromeda study, which really showed fantastic outcomes with duratumumab cyborg D without transplant, the question now comes up of do we really still need to transplant people or is it time to think about retiring transplant for everybody? For some people, we don't really know the answer. And so I imagine that everyone on this call probably does it differently, different centers approach this differently, just in the setting of you know, no real data on this question. Uh, but I'd say that typically how I approach it is that for patients who are candidates for transplants, meaning that they meet all the criteria that Dr. Zonder talked about, they're fit, there are otherwise limited comorbidities, the amyloid isn't too bad. So they're good medical candidates for transplant. We typically do now the standard daratumumab cyborg D chemotherapy. Um, if they have a great response, meaning really good suppression of all those bad amyloid proteins, and especially if the organs are starting to improve, then we have a discussion about how transplant could add something, but it seems like everything's moving in the right direction. And so um, the benefit of transplant would be unclear in that situation. To be clear, I don't know that there's no benefit, but we just don't really know. Um, versus for, for people who do the Daratum and Cyborg D if the response is inadequate, meaning that their light chains haven't dropped adequately or there's other signs uh, 
um, or evidence that we're not getting a good enough response out of the DERA cyber D, then we start thinking about second line therapies and transplant would be included there to say we need to do something to deepen the hematological response, suppress those bad amyloid proteins to maximize the likelihood that the organs are going to get better. And transplant is one very well proven way of doing that. But I think to emphasize there's this is a real challenge now in 2022. It's a good problem to have, but we really don't currently know the absolutely correct answer to that. And there probably is one. We just don't know it yet. 100% agree with that, those sentiments about, you know, what to do in a patient who's had a, a fantastic response to current modern therapy. I mean, that, that I was responding to the question of what makes a person a transplant candidate, but you're right. I mean, I think we have lots of patients who are transplant candidates who are opting out in the setting of a great response to cyborg didera, uh, you know, who, who have as an alternative the prospect of dera maintenance you know, with, with not very much uh, toxicity in most cases. Thank you. Dr. Learn, what, what would you like to add to that? You know, I just want to echo what everyone says. I mean, since Andromeda, our transplant um, rate has gone down significantly for AL. And, and I um, am like uh, both uh, Dr. Zonder and Dr. Tuckman. Um, I don't do transplant myself, but my referral to the transplant team uh, has definitely dropped. I mean, if you see a very excellent response there in CR already, um, it's hard to say, you know, they're going to need it. Um, I think is a different story, as Dr. Tuckman mentioned, that if they're not having a good response, then using transplant as a second line or third line is certainly something that uh, we still do. But I have to say that um, as a first line therapy, like we did before, um, you know, I haven't um, done that since Andromeda came out. So it's, it's really changed my practice. And I, and I practice at one of these centers that did a lot of transplants. Um, so, um, so but, but still a lot of patients I think this is a great question because a lot of patients keep asking, you know, when do I get my transplant? When do I get my transplant? And I tell them, you know, Andromeda was not designed with transplant in mind. And if you're doing great, uh, you know, you just follow this recipe um, um, and you don't need it. So I think there's still a lot of um, insecurity about not getting a transplant amongst the patients. But the data of Andromeda showed that majority of the people probably will not need transplant, at least not during that first two years. Actually, one thing that I'd add really quickly, obviously completely agree with those comments, uh, but one thing that I'd add and one common misconception that's out there is that a lot of people believe that transplant really is the end all be all that they need to get to, sort of as Dr. Lung is saying, um, and that there's a common misconception that, that transplant is the cure. Um, and maybe that's, I mean, we do have, all of us have some patients who have had transplants and even 10, 20 years later, the amyloid has not come back and maybe it is cured in those people, but typically we don't think of transplant as being a cure, which is why, again, it's really, um, as Dr. Luring says, it's not necessarily the thing that everyone necessarily needs to get to, especially these days when we have great chemotherapy options. Something, some, thank you so much for that. And, and something we haven't discussed yet in, in, so, and I just came upon a question for it. And this person specifically is referring to, is a heart transplant patient a candidate for CAR T therapy? And we haven't discussed CAR T therapy at all today. And um, so, and, uh, may, and we haven't gone into an explanation of it or anything. So, that, so maybe we'll just go right to the answer for this person's question and we'll cover CAR T another time because we're, we're, and we're over time anyway. So uh, Dr. Lyle, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you. And is a heart transplant patient a candidate for CAR T therapy? So I, I have not had any transplant patients that um, have undergone CAR T therapy afterwards. So I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I can at least piggyback on the 
prior discussion that a heart transplant patient, and depending what center you're at, they can still undergo the chemotherapy direct at their AL. And then also some centers like Stanford, for example, will do a heart transplant prior to a stem cell if that's the, the treatment of choice. Obviously, there's lots of discussion on you know chemotherapy versus stem cell. But as to CAR T therapy, I have not had any transplant patient. It would, of course, be a, a discussion with our hematology colleagues, but I have not had any transplant patient who's undergone CAR T therapy. Are you, are any of our physicians um, doing any CAR T therapy or have patients that are undergoing CAR T therapy for AL amyloidosis, maybe AL and MM because they realize MM is where it, it, it's really happening. Anyone? No? No, I mean, I would say it's, so uh, we're doing a lot of CAR T and well, as much as we can these days with productivity or production problems, but we're doing a lot of CAR T and myeloma, but it's really totally unproven in AL. And I think thinking about, for example, the stem cell transplant experience where doing a stem cell transplant in somebody with amyloid is much trickier and has a much higher complication rate in certain situations than doing it in myeloma. I think most of us would be pretty hesitant to pursue um, CAR-T in somebody who has amyloid kind of quote unquote for real, as opposed to sometimes you see little pieces of deposition in the bone marrow, other sites, that's probably a different question. But in somebody who has real cardiac kidney involvement, things like that. I think it would be hard to, to argue to do CAR T and someone like that. Not to say you couldn't, but that would be a pretty big stretch. Okay. Let's, well, let's take two more questions. Uh, well, three more questions. Okay. And, and then, we'll, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop because we've gone over time. We certainly appreciate all of you giving us your Saturday. We, we realize that you know, Saturday can be considered family day unless you're working like Dr. Learn and, and or you're running for multiple myeloma like Dr. Zond or so whatever. So, but we do appreciate your giving us this day and, and we don't take you for granted. Well, we do, but you know, what can I say? Okay, um, so um, here's a question. What are panel members thoughts on maintenance chemo plan for AL patients currently in um, complete hematological response? Okay, or very good partial response. If the patient is also an organ donation recipient, would, would their thoughts on maintenance chemo plans change? So we have two thoughts on maintenance. One, if, you, if you're a recipient of an organ transplant and one if you're, if you're not, but you're in complete hematological response. So we'll start with you, Dr. Sonder. Yeah, so this is a, I, I actually, I think this is a, a question really ripe for asking. And I think we don't know the answer. The, the only, um, so the only agents that we really sort of use in a maintenance fashion are DARA now because of Andromeda and uh, IMIDS when we use them. Uh, we tend to use on an ongoing basis, although you know, the, the tolerance to drugs like lenalidomide and pomalidomide sometimes is a little bit challenging. And so uh, they, they also don't generally end up being indefinite open-ended therapy, but they, they do tend to be longer. Um, you know, Andromeda did not, inform us about the absolute need for DARA maintenance. You know, it, it, uh, we, have, we have data from myeloma that, that suggests that perhaps if you get a deep response with, uh, with DARA uh, containing induction, that there might not be a lot of extra utility to the DARA maintenance. Um, we don't know the answer to this question. So, um, and, and actually it's, it's turning out to be difficult. I mean, there's, um, you know, there's interest in developing trials looking at transplant, you know, like what does transplant add to, to Andromeda? Uh, but then there's the question of length of therapy. And, you know, is it really, you know, is, it's hard to compare treatment strategies, you know, where in one case it's upfront a lot of therapy and in another case it's two and a half years, two, two to two and a half years of continuous therapy. Right, so it's it's um, it's a challenge. I, I, I mean, it's uh, I uh, I'd personally like to see a study where we looked at um, the question about uh, maintenance after DARA containing induction. Dr. Tuckman, I agree, uh, especially for frontline in amyloidosis. I think Andromeda is one of the few meaningful large studies that we have that really informs practice, and that was two years and then stopped and. So I think for me, I don't do routinely, or I don't routinely do indefinite maintenance in pretty much anyone with amyloidosis, at least newly diagnosed. And so for me, the question is typically, do we do the full two years or do we stop sooner? Sort of as Dr. Luang mentioned, sometimes the patients have a great response. We think we can maybe stop a little bit sooner. That's an unknown 
um, currently, but uh, I don't routinely do maintenance beyond the two years of Andromeda. And Dr. Laird? So um, I, I'm not sure the, the meaning of the question, although I'm gonna answer the question a little bit differently. Um, I, not that I disagree with anything Dr. Sonder and Dr. Tuckman said. I mean, it's, it's absolutely everything that I would do myself. But I take the question, um, I'm just going to take the question a little bit differently. If someone uh, were to be getting a kidney transplant, um, we do, uh, so it, it is our practice to extend the maintenance therapy until sometime after the kidney transplant because we don't want them recurring right around the time of the transplant. So that's, that's how I'm answering the question. Um, uh, now, someone who has, who had a kidney transplant and the kidney function is stable and there's no evidence of um, recurrence, then yes, I, you know, we, we would take them off once they meet the, you know, the two-year mark or, or whatever. But, but um, like I said, if someone was about to get a kidney transplant, um, we have extended the two-year period um, just to make sure that they wouldn't recur right around the transplant. So that's, that's my take on the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got a few more questions. But Dr. Learn, since, since we have you here, there, there's another question slipped in, which is really, I think, important for people to hear. And we'll give everyone a chance to answer this, but how long does a person have to be in complete hematological response if they have a donor in order to get a kidney transplant? We don't make them wait. Um, as Dr. Tuckman and Dr. Zonder alluded to, uh, we don't think that um, anything cures ALM ligosis um, or myeloma. Um, however, um, especially with ALM ligosis, we think that once uh, a patient reaches a complete response, um, then they're ready to go. I mean, um, because it's not a curable disease, the longer you wait, the more likely that the patient will relapse. This is a very different concept from a uh, solid cancer where if you had colon cancer and you go disease-free for five years, the likelihood that your cure is extremely high. In a multiple myeloma patient, if you're, if you're disease-free for five years, your risk of relapse actually is increasing uh, year after year, whereas the, the opposite is true for someone with solid cancer. So, so that's why we don't uh, wait. Uh, now, myeloma is different, but for amyloid, um, as soon as they hit um, complete response, uh, we would be willing to give them a kidney transplant. So that could be three months, that could be two months, that could be six months. Yeah, we, so, so typically, um, you couldn't get a transplant right away anyway. Even if everything was, you know, approved, it would still take about three months to line up the surgery schedule, the donor, and, and everything else. So we automatically have about three months built in to follow them anyway. Um, and so, so uh, we typically would retest them right before the transplant. And if everything's still um, in CR at that time, then it's a go. Great. And Dr. Zonder, how about you at your joint? Um, you know, my, my experience is that uh, um, different kidney transplant programs sort of have different um, criteria, you know, about when they're willing to, uh, you know, list a patient. Um, and I'm not talking about listing because I'm talking about someone that brings their own donor. Okay. Um, well, I, I think uh, pretty universal uh, amongst uh, in every center we've uh, sent to that it's it's an achievement of complete remission and there's not really a specification about how long that complete remission has to be, but they all pretty much demand that patients are in remission. Okay, and Dr. Tuckman? Totally agree, nothing to add. Okay, great. And, and what's the waiting list right now in, in if, if someone doesn't have a donor, what's the waiting list right now in, in, the, in the Carolinas? 
Oh, I think it's typically about five years from, from the start of dialysis. I mean, Dr. Lung probably knows better than I do what the overall situation is, but I think it's about five years. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Lin? Yeah, so um, it depends on blood group type um, and it depends on the region of the country too. So uh, if you need a kidney transplant, definitely um, call on Dr. Lyle because uh, Florida has the fastest um, moving list, the shortest list. Um, actually here in the upper Midwest, we have one of the longer ones. Um, so um, blood group O tends, patients with blood group O will wait the longest. Um, patients with AB will wait the shortest. Um, so there is a little bit of variation depending on which part of the country um, the patient lives. So in other words, we want the warmer weather with a lot of rain making it very skiddy on the highway. Is that what we're looking for? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure why um, the list is shortest in Florida um, because, you know, if you think uh, Florida, you know, is not population based because otherwise New York and California would be the shortest, but they're not. So I'm not really sure why Florida has a shorter list than anyone, but but Helmet year laws. after year. What? Helmet laws. <laughs> or the lack thereof. There you go. Okay. We just have um we just have two more questions, okay? What okay, this person has uh ALM lidosis and they have a, an effect on their quadricep muscles. Okay, they're on dexamethasone, eight milligrams once weekly, and Darzalex monthly for one and a half years. They've been experiencing quadricep acing and weakness for several months. Uh, they also have aortic valve stenosis. What might be the causes of their quadricep symptoms? Anyone? Amyloid itself or dexamethasone? Okay, Lyle. We can't, okay, this is good. It's good to know everyone doesn't know everything. Okay, this is important. Okay. Well, I mean, so, uh, so, you, so amyloid deposits in the muscles. So amyloid myopathy is relatively uncommon, but it happens and it can cause weakness, especially in kind of the larger muscles like the hips. So it could be that, especially if the amyloid is not all that well controlled. But as Dr. Zondra mentioned, dexamethasone can also do it. So steroid myopathy is also a thing where basically long-term steroid exposure causes muscle breakdown and eventually muscle weakness. It's pretty uncommon to see that with weekly dexamethasone the way we do it, but especially in somebody who's been on it for that long, it's possible. And so I would think probably a neurology visit and they can do their studies, nerve conduction studies and things like that to sort it out. And then sometimes even muscle biopsies can be helpful, but sometimes we don't know. And in that situation, I'd probably say the dexamethasone may not be doing that much anyway after a year and a half of it. So maybe think about stopping it. But of course, that's a discussion between uh, the person and his and her, his or her physician. Okay, maybe, great. Think about, maybe think about spinal stenosis. I mean, as a cause of lower extremity weakness as well. Seen in amyloidosis, uh, ATTR, particular, you know, particularly, but uh, it's seen patient age age group that we see AL and it's it's a common medical issue. Okay, before I ask this last question, I do want to get your okay, doctors, that when I email you some questions that we didn't get to today, you will kindly respond so we can get back to all of our patients so they, they can get their questions answered. Can I get a nod from everyone? Okay, great. We have witnesses for that too. Great. Okay, last question. Okay, this person, I had a, key, a CT scan that showed advanced calcification in their abdomen lining of the GI tract uh, they have severe involvement of their pancreas. Okay, they have AL amyloidosis. Okay, they want you to explain what the calcifications are and what they mean. So I, I don't know if the calcifications are in the, literally in the wall of the bowel, but am, amyloid deposits in soft tissues can definitely over time calcify. Uh, we see that in like amyloid adenopathy, like when lymph nodes are involved, it's extremely common uh, for, for the deposits to become calcified. Um, I, you know, we also, I've also seen that in patients who have omental involvement, which is the, the soft tissue webbing that sort of anchors the gut. 
and you know it's sort of intermixed with loops of vowel and so I, I have seen that um, that's so I, I would wonder about that uh, I don't know what others think any other comments on that yeah I've seen that in patients with intra-abdominal amyloid um, so it's common it's actually pretty common in patients with multoma that develop amyloid and they just uh, deposit amyloid all over the abdominal cavity. And over time that will calcify. So the fresh stuff will not be calcified, but um, over time calcium deposits will go in and start uh, replacing it. Um, you know, it's hard to know what they mean by being on the bowel. Uh, we have to see a picture of it to see what it is, but but yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen it in that situation. And, and I've also seen it, uh, as Dr. Saunders said, in patients with lymph node amyloid, they, over time, that amyloid gets replaced. Um, and pulmonary yeah. nodules. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, pulmonary nodules, too, is another common. Um, actually, I, I don't know if the amyloid is being replaced or it attracts calcium to it, so. Hmm. Okay, well, we thank you all so much. And I know I speak for everyone when I say that. So we appreciate it. We will, um, Bob will make sure that today's event will be up on our YouTube channel and also on our website, amyloidosisupport.org within the next few weeks. Uh, this will also be shared with One Amyloidosis Voice and our Facebook groups. Um, if you have any questions at all, send an email to info at amyloidosissupport.org. We have wonderful doctors and advisors. I don't play doctor. Um, well, not that kind of doctor. Okay. Anyway, so um, call us day or night. You know we prefer days. Um, and don't forget the survey. And thank you all. And stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.